Hey, good morning, everybody. We're on the record. Uh, we are outside the presence of the jury uh, to discuss the admissibility of the body worn cam of which witness is it, Mr. Nelson? All right, and I have had a chance to review it. Mr. Frank, uh, the state had an objection. Good morning, Your Honor. Yes, we do have uh, objections to the body worn camera video. Um, as I indicated to counsel last night, uh, we would object to admission of Officer Chang's body worn camera video after the timestamp of 1:15:35, um, that, as I think I tried to point out, is that Zulu time thing rather than the regular time that the MPDs are in. But it's also running time 5:12 um, on the scale below. Um, within that first 5:12, um, there is a particular piece that we need to talk about because. Officer Chang sits in his squad car and runs Mr. Floyd's name while his body cam is looking right at the screen. And information about Mr. Floyd pops up. Some of that is actually, uh, you're able to read. Um, and because this, if it's made an exhibit, would be public, uh, we think it's inappropriate to have information about Mr. Floyd on that screen available as an exhibit or generally to the public. So somehow uh, that has to be obscured. We don't care if a black box is put over it, if it's obscured in some way. But it's within that portion of the rest of the video we recognize is admissible and relevant. Because that time frame is the incident itself. Officer Chang arrives, interacts with the two officers and Mr. Floyd as they go over. After uh, Officer Chang comes back over to the Dragon Walk side of 38th Street. He admits in a statement he no longer sees what's going on over there. Because this is a reasonable officer standard, as we all know, what um, happens after the restraint and across the street on 38th um, is simply irrelevant to the issues at hand. So after that point in the video is where we believe it reasonably loses any relevance. After that point, of course, there's audio, and Officer Chang speaks to the two individuals that are uh, were passengers in the car, and it's you know just full of hearsay, and some of that would be offered to prove, we believe, the truth of the matters asserted in those statements about what happened. So um, it's full of hearsay after that. Um, there is a moment where Officer Chang, towards the end, is standing around as the officers do some follow-up. And this court allowed video of that time period as relevant to conducting the, or finishing their investigation. So I see where the court might find that particular period of Officer Chang's video to have some relevance. So in that sense, we would object to that portion, you know, really as cumulative, cumulative, because of course, the better video of that has already been admitted uh, with Officer Chauvin's body cam during that time period when Officer King comes out. I believe that was the court's ruling about why that's relevant. It shows something about the intentions of their uh, investigation. So our objections are um, being able to read the screen in Officer Chang's squad car if he pulls up the information about Mr. Floyd. After 1.15.35 is simply not relevant. It's full of hearsay and potentially a cumulative objection as well. Thank you. If we were to characterize this as, as bystander video of the bystanders near the Dragon Walk, who were the people that Mr. Floyd was with earlier that day, or earlier before this, going into the store, how is it different from the bystander videos that the state offered and played with regard to statements that were made? and? And the other bystanders are part of the incident. Certainly the defense you know, has regularly cross-examined about the tone of voice of those bystanders and their effect, apparently, on Mr. Chauvin uh, at the scene. They are part of the incident itself. They cannot really be separated from uh, the issues involved in the restraint and the reasonableness of it. And I 
fully expect that's why there was no objection to that. This is a video of across the street. Um, in my review of the video, you can't even hear what's going on in this video until the ambulance has come and gone and one of the witnesses starts to walk this way, you know, towards the Dragon Walk. So it does not capture the relevant interactions and portions of the incident. Okay, Mr. Nelson. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, I would uh, break uh, Mr. Chang's uh, video into kind of three relevant sections or three pertinent sections, I should say. The first being the initial reaction as, as described by Mr. Frank, the first approximate five minutes of the video. Um, and then there is a period of time, a second period of time where Officer Chang is dealing with the passengers. Um, and then the third part of uh, the video I would characterize as the occurrences after the uh, ambulance has arrived and left and what happens there. In terms of the first section, I do believe that it is relevant to, um, to the analysis. It shows another perspective of what was happening at that particular moment. Um, I would need to figure out fairly quickly uh, how to get that blocked, uh, how to get those portions of the computer screen blocked um, that contain uh, information about Mr. Floyd. Um, there's that section, and I don't think subject to uh, that redaction, I don't think the state apparently objects to that. The second part um, I believe is, is relevant because it shows another officer's reaction to what is going on. It shows other bystanders' reactions to what is going on. And you can see during that period that Officer Chang is pacing kind of back and forth, trying to split his attention between the passengers and also observing uh, the what's happening across the street. Again, in terms of the reaction to the crowd and the, and the crowd uh, growing mo more and more vociferous as time progresses. Um, so I do think it's relevant because it shows it from a distance. It shows Officer Chang walking. It shows uh, at scenes where people are standing on other sides of the street. It shows the traffic. It shows people slowing down and watching. There's a lot of information that can be gleaned from that uh, segment. The third segment I think is also relevant because it demonstrates, again, the continuing efforts of the police and also the continuing, continuing interactions with um, the citizens who observed um, and uh, goes to, as, as is being alluded to, um, is that if the crowd was a distraction or the officers perceived this gathering of people, whether we want to call it a crowd or a group or whatever, um, whether the officers perceived that to be a risk or a threat and how that may have continued and, and ultimately influenced officers' decisions. So um, I believe it is highly relevant. I do not believe it is hearsay in the sense of you don't hear anything, essentially very little that the officers say. The officers don't talk about what just happened over there with one small exception uh, relevant to uh, Mr. Williams and uh, Ms. Hansen. There's some comments there. I believe that part may already be in in one of the other body cameras. I'd have to go back and double check. That being said, Your Honor, I don't think it's cumulative because it, it again shows a different perspective. It shows a reaction of another police officer and what he was doing. It shows the surroundings from a different perspective and uh, is highly relevant to the trier fact. I have reviewed the entire uh, film drive that contains the exhibit and I do find that it is relevant and not cumulative to a certain point. Uh, I would note that the body cam includes video of, from a distance, what is happening in front of Cup Foods, but also the timing of when the fire engine, engine 17, shows up. And since the <coughs> emergency EMS response has been litigated in this case and is relevant as to when EMS showed up, when the fire engine showed up, um, Firefighter Hansen specifically described how she would assume it'd be within three minutes. This puts that in a time frame uh, on the EMS call, and so that is relevant. And to the extent that there are any statements made 
I find they're not offered for the truth of the matter asserted, or to the extent they are, they fall into the residual exception because these are people just making comments of their observations at the scene. There's no motive for them to lie or anything else, so they would uh, certainly be reliable. They're not inculpatory in any way, and so I think it would fall under the uh, 807 residual hearsay, even if it is offered for the truth of the matter asserted, but it does not appear to be that the state is trying or the defense is trying to prove the truth of the matter asserted. So with that, I'm going to order that you redact the part um, when the officer is looking up on the computer. I think for today's purposes, you can simply fast forward through it uh, 30 seconds or so when he's in, when you get to that point. And that way the jury won't see it when you publish it today, but it's gotta be redacted. You gotta take it back and before we submit this to the jury for deliberation, it has to be taken out. Uh, so basically when he gets in the squad until when he gets back out of the squad. And I'll advise him that it's been edited to take out irrelevant materials up until the time the fire engine leaves. Anything after that is not really relevant. To some extent it is cumulative as the state has said. But up through the time the fire engine leaves is appropriate. So with that redaction in the middle and the ending after the fire engine leaves, uh, the body warrant cam will be admissible. We should be able to, within about 10 minutes, accomplish that. All right. You can actually accomplish the redaction within 10 minutes? I would just be cutting those clips out rather than trying to put some sort of black screen on. And no, that's, that would be my preference. And so if, if I can have about 10 minutes, Your Honor. Let's reconvene now. Let's bring the jury back at 930, and we'll start at 930. Yeah. This is your copy, Mr. Nelson? All right, we're coming at 9.30. Anything else that we need to go over? All right, we're off the record then.
morning, everybody. Does the state have an additional witness? Your Honor, the state of Minnesota rests. Thank you. Mr. Nelson, are you ready to proceed? Yeah, Call your first witness. Your Honor, the defense calls Scott Creighton. Something I have to read the jury, but you can be seated. All right, hold on, let me try and. My apologies. All right, let's have you give your first, uh, middle, and last name and spell each of your names. My name is Scott Robbie Creighton, C-R-E-I-G-H-T-O-N. Members of the jury, uh, you are about to hear evidence of an occurrence involving George Floyd on May 6, 2019. This evidence is being admitted solely for the limited purpose of showing what effects the ingestion of opioids may or may not have had on the physical well-being of George Floyd. This evidence is not to be used as evidence of the character of George Floyd. Mr. Nelson. Thank you. Mr. Creighton, by whom are you currently employed? Uh, your, your Honor, is there any way that we can, um, I could hear it a little louder? Can you be a little louder? I'm having a difficult headache. Sorry about that, sir. No problem, sir. I just want to make sure I hear all the questions. Is that better? Yes, it is. Okay. By whom are you currently employed? Uh, right now, I'm uh, currently retired. I'm okay. not employed by anybody. Prior to your retirement, whom, by whom were you employed? Uh, the City of Minneapolis Police Department. And how long did you work for the City of Minneapolis Police Department? 28 years. Can you describe for the jury generally the various roles that you had for the Minneapolis Police Department? Yes, I will. Um, 
I started in 1993. Uh, I started on the street working as a 911 responder. Um, I did six years as a 911 responder, and then I transferred over to public housing for approximately nine months as a uh, public housing uh, officer. And then from there, I went to the 4th Precinct and became a community response team member um, involved as a street level narcotics investigator. Uh, I did that for 22 years. All right. Now, were you on duty on uh, May 6th of 2019? Yes, I was. If you had an opportunity um, to review various police reports and uh, body-worn cameras from an incident on that date? Yes, I have. On that date at approximately 4 or be just before 5 o'clock p.m., did you execute a traffic stop of a red uh, Ford Explorer? Yes, I did. And did you approach the passenger side? Yes, I did. Can you describe uh, just very briefly an, the initial interaction that you had with the passenger of that vehicle? Um, I approached the vehicle uh, on the passenger side. Uh, the passenger window was down. Um, I started giving the, the individual uh, that, was on, that was in the passenger seat commands several times. Um, uh, the passenger was um, unresponsive and non-compliant to my commands. Um, I then had to um, physically reach in because uh, I wanted to see his hands because I couldn't see his hands. I reached in finally and grabbed his hand to put it up on the dash and then that individual was uh, taken from the vehicle and handcuffed. Um, did you make any observations as to uh, the passenger's behavior? Could you repeat that question, sir? I'm sorry. Did you make any additional observations as to the passenger's behavior? Yeah, as, uh, in my mind, his, his behavior was uh, very nervous, anxious. Um, I will withdraw that question. In terms of, did you see the passenger uh, do anything physically with his hands? Yes, he turned away from me towards the driver's seat as continually uh, as I was given him commands to see his hands. Did you draw your service weapon? Yes, I did. Did you um, observe the passenger put anything in his mouth? Uh, can you say that one more time, sir? I'm sorry. Did you observe the passenger put anything in his mouth? No, I didn't. Did you, uh, were you wearing a body-worn camera issued by the city of Minneapolis on that day? Yes, I was. And have you had an opportunity to review your body-worn camera prior to today's testimony? Yes, I have. Your Honor, um, based upon the order, I would move to uh, admit and publish Exhibit 1051. All right. Uh, 1051 is received subject to the motion of limine. we may publish. Can you undo your uh, seatbelt, sir? Sir, passenger, can you undo your seatbelt? Go, go ahead and undo your seatbelt. I, I, don't, I don't plan on shooting you. I'm just saying, just take your, take your time. Okay, relax. Just undo your seatbelt. Let her take care of her guy. Just keep your hands out where I can see them. Hey! Let me... Keep your hands where I can fucking see them! Okay? Put them up on the dash. Put them on the dash. I'm not going to shoot you. Put your hands on the dash! Put your hands on the dash. Last time I'm going to tell you that. It's simple. He keeps hey, moving his hands hand around. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He, he won't listen to what I have to say. Okay. Put him on, the, on your head. Your head. Okay. Okay, okay, man. Open your mouth. Okay, Spit man. out what you got. Spit out what you got. I'm going to tase you. Spit it out. He's eating all Don't you jerk you. away from me. Put your hands behind your That was one yellow pill, boss. Okay, now slowly come on out. Hand on your head. Hand on your head. Okay, relax then. 
You're not, you're not going to get beat up or nothing. You just follow what we're asking you to do. Did you subsequently identify the uh, driver of the, or excuse me, the passenger? Yes, I did. And who is that? Mr. Floyd. Um, Your Honor, based on the court's ruling, I have no further questions for this witness. Cross examination. Good morning, Officer Creighton. Good morning. You testified that you were the officer who approached the passenger side of the vehicle. You approached George Floyd on May 6th of 2019, is that right? That's correct, yes. And you had your gun drawn when you approached Mr. Floyd, isn't that right? Yes, I pulled it, yes. And when you approached Mr. Floyd, he said, don't shoot me, man, I don't want to get shot, right? Something like that, yes. You told him to undo his seatbelt, correct? That's correct, yes, ma'am. And he did that, right? Yes, he did. And then you said, put your hands where I can see them, correct? Yes. And then he put his hands in the air? Yes. And then you told him to put his hands on the dash, is that right? That's correct. And that was when you grabbed his hand and forcibly put it on the dashboard of the vehicle, correct? Bone, yes. And then the other officer with you on the other side of the vehicle changed that to put your hands on your head, correct? That's correct. And then he put his hands on his head, right? That's correct, yes. And there was one officer who said that they were going to tase him, right? That's what I heard, yes. And you were yelling pretty loud, correct? Yes, I was, yes. It, it escalated real quick. Some profanity as well, correct? Yes. And you had your gun drawn the whole time you were giving commands, right? Once I started ordering him and he refused to show me his hands, yes, I eventually it escalated where I pulled my gun, yes, ma'am. And he was awake, correct? What's that, ma'am? Mr. Floyd was awake. Was he awake during this incident? Yes. He was conscious? Yes. He didn't appear to be in medical distress to you when you were pulling him out of the car, is that right? He was talking to you, he was standing up, is that right? Um, I don't know if it was specifically, sometimes he was talking, sometimes he was mumbling. Uh, he was incoherent in my mind a lot of the time during there. But you got him out of the car and you handcuffed him, right? That's correct, ma'am. And he stood next to the car, right? Yes, ma'am. He asked you not to beat him up, correct? That's correct, yes. He was able to walk, right? Yes, he was. He continued to talk to you? Yes.
Technology is not our friend today. Ms. Aldridge, if you would. Thank you, Your Honor. Officer Green, you were describing that you got Mr. Floyd out of the car, correct? Yes. And he stood next to the car and you handcuffed him, correct? Uh, me and another officer had to physically handcuff him, yes. And he didn't fall down, correct? No, he didn't fall down. Nothing further, Your Honor. Anything further? Officer Creighton, uh, there was another officer on the driver's side dealing with the driver? Yes, that's correct, actually two. And that officer was speaking to uh, or giving commands to the driver? That's correct. Simultaneous to the time that you were giving commands to Mr. Floyd? That's correct. Did you hear the officer say, spit it out? I may have, yes. I don't, I, you'd have to see the video and if that's what the video shows and that's what occurred. Okay, I have no further questions. Right. Anything further? Officer Creighton, you were just asking questions about what the other officers were doing. You were interacting with Mr. Floyd, correct? Yes. And while you were interacting with Mr. Floyd, he didn't collapse on the ground, correct? Wait a minute. What was the question? Can you speak up a little louder, ma'am? While you were interacting with Mr. Floyd, he didn't collapse on the ground, correct? No, he did not. Well, the answer is stricken. The objection is sustained. You were asking questions about what the other officers were doing, correct? That's correct. Your attention was focused on Mr. Floyd, correct? Yes, it was. And Mr. Floyd didn't drop dead while you were interacting with him, correct? No. Thank you. Nothing further. Anything further? No, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. Next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, at this time, the defense calls Michelle Mosing. Swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. Have a seat. And before you begin, uh, if you could state your full name, spell each of your names, and then hold off, Mr. Nelson. Just give your full name and spell each name. Uh, first name is Michelle, M I C H E L L E. Last name is Mosing, M-O-S-E-N-G. And if you're comfortable taking off the mask, I pretty much leave it up to you, but if that would make it easier to hear you, that would be appreciated. <laughs> uh, members of the jury, this again uh, is regarding an incident or an occurrence involving George Floyd on May 6, 2019. As I told you before, this evidence is being admitted solely for the limited purpose of showing what effects the ingestion of opioids may or may not have had on the physical well-being of George Floyd. This evidence is not to be used as evidence of the character of George Floyd. Mr. Nelson, you may inquire. Thank you. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Um, by whom are you currently employed? I am retired. Okay, prior to your retirement, uh, where were you employed? I was a paramedic at Hennepin County Medical Center, EMS. How long were you a paramedic for Hennepin County? Just under 34 years. Okay. And um, can you describe the education that you had uh, to become a paramedic? Uh, my, I have a two-year degree in emergency medical care and rescue from Mankato State. Um, and then I actually got an additional registered nursing. I uh, graduated from St. Mary's University in 91. Okay. And um, so you worked as a paramedic for Hennepin County for the entirety of your career, or did you have other employment? I actually worked for a year in Dakota County um, for one year, and then I uh, have worked at Hennepin, or had worked at Hennepin ever since. 
fair to say you've gone to a large number of calls during the course of your career. Yes. All right. And you may not remember every specific detail about every call, correct? No. And uh, as a paramedic, do you maintain records about each call that you uh, go to in order to assess the patient's care? Yes, we do a run sheet or a patient, patient medical record that we hand off okay. at the emergency room. Now, pr you can just speak up just a little bit. Sorry. No problem. Uh, prior to, um, to your testimony today, have you had an opportunity to review a run sheet uh, from May 6th of 2019 involving George Perry Floyd? Yes. Um, do you recall all of those details off the top of your head now? No. All right. Now, in terms of um, your recollection of May 6th of 2019, were you uh, summons to the Minneapolis Police Department? Yes, Precinct 4. To care for, to uh, attend to Mr. Floyd? Yes. Um, upon arriving at the 4th Precinct, did you uh, talk to Mr. Floyd? Yes. Did you learn information from Mr. Floyd about um, at what he had consumed and the time frame he had consumed it in? Yeah, it was uh, quite hard to assess him. Um, he was upset and um, confused. Some of the things he said were... Uh, I'm going to straight into his mental spot, so if you could perhaps leave. Certainly. Did Mr. Floyd, were you able to learn that Mr. Floyd had consumed some narcotics that day? Yes. What did he tell you specifically about what narcotics he had taken and when he had taken them? He, he told me that he had been taking multiple, like every 20 minutes, um, and it was a... a I don't remember if it was Oxy or Percocet, but it was a um, opioid-based. It wasn't real consistent with his behavior. At that point, it was real elevated and agitated. No, I'm, I'm gonna. The last statement about Sorry. agitation is stricken as not responsive. You can just wait for the next question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but he informed you he had taken some some sort of an opioid. Uh, every 20 minutes or something like that, correct? And then another one as the officer came up. Okay, so he told you that he had taken a pill um, at the time the officers were apprehending him. Correct. Did you do a physical assessment of Mr. Floyd at that time? Yes. Specifically, did you take his blood pressure? Yes, I took a set of vitals. Okay. Um, would you agree that uh, your first vitals were taken at approximately 134 and 59 seconds. Without looking at the run sheet, I wouldn't know for oh. sure. It, would it refresh your recollection to review the run sheet? Yes. May I approach the witness room? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I've written on here that, yeah, it was 13.34 was the first recorded vital signs. That refreshes your recollection? Yes. Did you need it back? Uh, probably. I'd like to testify for memory. If you need to refresh your memory with that, just let us know and we'll allow you to refresh your memory. But otherwise, testify to your memory as best you can. Okay. Thank you. Sure. At, at approximately 13.34, that's 1.34 p.m., agreed? You took his vitals, correct? Correct. And that would include his bl blood pressure at the time? Yes. And did you record what his blood pressure was at that time? Yes, it was 216 over 160. Did you ultimately make recommendations uh, to transport Mr. Floyd to the hospital? Based on that and other issues. Okay. Um, and ultimately, did he was he brought to the hospital? Eventually. I believe that's uh, all I have, Your Honor. Ms. Eldridge.
Good morning, Ms. Mozang. Good morning. You provided treatment to George Floyd on May 6, 2019, correct? Correct. Is that yes. Right? And you were concerned about his blood pressure at that time, correct? That was one of the things. And in, in the course of your treatment of him, he explained that his high blood pressure wasn't something new, right? Yeah, initially he denied medical issues, but then when I discovered his blood pressure, I specifically asked again, and he said yes, he had history of hypertension and had not been taking his medication. And he said he hadn't been taking his blood pressure medication for months, correct? Correct. And he told you that he swallowed some pills, right? Yes. Uh, approximately seven Percocet, correct? Mm. I documented, yeah, seven to nine every 20 minutes or so for a while. And Percocet is a brand name, right? Yes. Is that oxycodone and, and acetaminophen? Yes. And it's used to treat pain, correct? Correct. You testified that it's an opioid, yes? Correct. So he told you that he had been taking those pills throughout the day, right? Yes, and he, I asked him why. He said he's because he was addicted. He told you he was addicted and he responded to your questions about taking the pills, correct? Correct. And he was able to walk, correct? Yes. He was able to stand up. Correct. And you wanted him to go to the hospital, uh, right? Correct. And he didn't feel like he wanted to go to the hospital, correct? Was, he was resistant to going to the hospital, right? I know he was real resistant to get on our bed. He was, resi he was, it was hard to tell exactly what he was upset about. I'm gonna object at this point, I'm Your sorry. Honor. Um, just with respect to going to the hospital, Your Honor. Yes. I'm gonna limit your question, the question I asked to that. He didn't wanna to go to the hospital, right? I'll say yes. It took some time to convince him to go to the hospital, yes. correct? And you indicated that uh, he told you he had been addicted to opioids, correct? Correct. And he had been addicted to opioids at that point for a year and a half, right? I am not aware of that. But he didn't feel like he needed to go to the hospital. He didn't want to go with us at that point. And you were referred to your run report, right? The, the record that you keep in terms of the treatment of patients. You, you see that up there, correct? Yes. Um, and according to your run report, you documented that Mr. Floyd was alert, correct? Yes. And that he obeyed commands, correct? Eventually. That's what's in your report, <laughs> right? Correct? Correct. And that he had an appropriate response to stimulation. Correct. Yes. Correct. Um, he wasn't nauseous or vomiting when you were treating him, right? No. His respiratory rate was normal. Yes. Um, it was elevated at times. You wrote remember. respiratory effort normal in your report, correct? At the beginning, yes. His effort was normal. It was increased at times. And throughout your documentation, you wrote respiratory effort normal, correct? Correct. At at 1334, at, 14, at 1409, at 1426. All those notes, you indicated that his respiratory effort was normal, correct? Correct. He was not in respiratory distress, correct? No. His blood oxygen level was normal, right? Correct. His pulse was normal, correct? Um, yes. His heart rhythm was regular or normal, right? Correct. His EKG was normal. Correct. He had a normal rhythm, the sinus rhythm, which is the rhythm of a normal healthy heart, correct? Correct. And you indicated that you had been um, worried about high blood pressure for the possibility of a stroke, right? Among other things, yes. But he didn't have a stroke, right? Didn't have any indications that we were picking up at the time. He didn't have a stroke while you were with him? No. He was never given Narcan, correct? Correct. He didn't stop breathing. No. His heart didn't stop. No. He didn't go into cardiac arrest. No. He didn't go into a coma. No. And you took him to the hospital, correct? Correct. And he was monitored for two hours and released right after, right? I don't know. <laughs> Nothing further, Your Honor. Anything further? No, Your Honor. 
Thank you. You may step down. Sure. Members of the jury, we're going to take a lawyerly five-minute break, which means it'll probably be ten. But uh, let's go with five minutes for now. Thank you.
All right, we're on the record. I'll decide the hearing of the jury. Come on up. All right, you can just have a seat for now. Uh, if you testify, I'll place you under oath, but otherwise, uh, we're just going to have a discussion a little bit here. So, uh, but we do need to hear you so that the court reporter can take everything down. So, uh, you have been subpoenaed by the defense. I can't uh, even really. That. You've been subpoenaed by the defense uh, to answer certain questions about uh, being with George Floyd on May 25th, 2020, uh, what you observed about his physical condition at various points in Cup Foods, and basically a time frame on when you were with him that day and what you observed about him, uh, specifically I think focusing mostly on the time in Cup Foods but then also in the motor vehicle before the police came to the window. Yep. Okay, uh, and it's my and you're uh, willing to answer those questions yes. about George yes. Floyd. Okay, uh, this the parties also have the right to ask you in order to test whether your perceptions are accurate mm -hmm. on whether you were under the influence of drugs or alcohol that day. Are you willing to answer yes. that question? Yes. Okay. Am I or him? Are you willing to answer the question well, whether you were under the oh, influence yes. of drugs or alcohol? Yes, I was not. <laughs> okay, we're not going to be eliciting an opinion from you whether George Floyd was under the influence, just for how he looked, okay, uh, and you know how he acted, yep. but not an opinion about whether he was under the influence. Okay. But the lawyers, in order to make sure that the jury knows whether to consider your evidence and how much weight to give it, is whether you were sober or under the influence. Are, are you willing to answer that question? Yes. Okay, now you understand, I don't find that those questions would uh, expose you to criminal liability, but you do have a Fifth Amendment right uh, mm -hmm. not to incriminate yourself. Um, do you need time to talk to a lawyer? Mm -hmm. And I have limited the lawyers to those topics so as not to get anything that might tend to incriminate you that you're not expecting. Okay? Yep. Do you have any questions? No. Do you need time to talk to a lawyer? No. Okay, ready to go then? Yes. All right. What we're going to do is we're going to bring the jury back in, and then I'm going to have you stand up so I can swear you in, and then we'll go from there. Do you have any questions? No. Okay, great. Let's bring in the jury. And you can just remain seated when the jury comes in. Oh, you want to stand up? You can stay seated. Oh. I'll ask you to stand to be sworn, but just follow my directions, you'll be fine. Mr. Nelson, you may call your next witness. Your Honor, the defense calls Shawanda Hill. Ms. Hill, if you could stand right in the witness chair. Or actually, there is fine. You can raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right, have a seat, please. And before we begin, uh, we're going to have you state your full name, spelling each of your names. Shawanda, S-H-A-W-A-N-D-A, -A -A, Renee, R-E-N-E-E, -E -E, Hill, H-I-L-L. -L. Mr. Nelson? Thank you. 
Good morning, Ms. Hill. Hi. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, I just have a few questions about May 25th of 2020. Do you recall that date? Yes. On that date, were you at the Cup Foods located in Minneapolis? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Did you run into anybody that you knew while you were there? Yes, George Floyd. And uh, while you were at the Cup Foods or in the Cup Foods, did you have an opportunity to observe Mr. Floyd's behavior, demeanor, things of that nature? Yes. How would you describe Mr. Floyd's behavior while inside of the Cup Foods? Happy, <clears throat> normal, talking, alert. Okay. Did uh, you? Uh, did he offer to give you a ride? Yes. A ride to wherever it was My you were going? House. And um, so did you go to his car with him? Yes. Once you got into the car, did you observe any changes to his demeanor? When we were in the car for the first like eight minutes, we were talking and, you know what I'm saying, hugging, you know what I'm saying, talking about what we were about to do. And then I got a phone call. And so I was on the phone for the rest of the time until the little boys came to the truck, to the car. He fell asleep at that time. So at some point during the course of the time that you were in the car with Mr. Floyd, Mr. Ho Floyd suddenly fell asleep, Yes. Right? And the phone call you received, was that from your daughter? Yes. And so you were talking with your daughter during that time? Yes. Um, and you described, uh, would you agree that at, at some point, uh, some you said some little boys, are those employees of the yes. store? <laughs> Sorry, yes. That's okay. Um, the store employees came and approached the car, correct? Yes. And at that point, Mr. Floyd suddenly fell asleep? He was already asleep. He was already sleeping? Yes, when they came to the car. And when they came there, I tried to wake him up. They tried to wake him up. I tried to wake him up over and over. And his friend tried to wake him up. And he kept, he woke up. Then he'll say something. Uh, he made a little gesture, you know, and nodded back off. Okay. Was that, that a couple times. Was that a, kind of a sudden change from how you observed him in the store to the car? Yes, but he already told me in the store he was tired because he had been working. I'm object. There's an objection. Meeting? Hold on. Objection, Carlos? Meeting? Yes, the answer is stricken. Overruled. Um, and so at some point did the uh, store clerks leave the side of the car? Yes, I told him that I would wake him up and send him in there because I didn't have the money on me. I used my money. So. Okay. And did you continue to try to rouse yes. Ms. Mr. Floyd? Wait, wait until he finishes the question so that we don't overlap. Okay? Because the court report is taking everything down. It's really hard to feel over. Oh, okay. Okay? Thanks. Thank you. Um, so did you continue to try to uh, awaken Mr. Floyd? Yes, I tried a couple times, but then, you know... I just let it go for a minute because I was back on the phone and all right. And, the rest out. and did the store clerks come back to the car a second time? No. Okay. And um, were you uh, at some point the police officers approached the car? Yes. And um, Mr. Floyd uh, was aroused by the police? Yes. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Frank. Good morning, Ms. Hill. I just have a couple of follow-up questions for you, okay? Yes. Um, so during the period that you were with Mr. Floyd in the store, uh, he was, uh, you said he was alert? Yes. Friendly? Yes. Talkative? Happy talking, yes. And, that. Hug him. Okay. Yeah. and when you went uh, out to the store, he walked by himself out to the store? Yes. In fact, did a little dance as he went out to the yes. car? We just have to make sure that you yes. wait till the question's done so we aren't talking over each other, okay? I know it's a hard habit to break, but we just have to be careful with that, okay? And when you got back to the car, um, at some point he nodded off. Yes. Um, but you were able to wake him, correct? Yes. And talk to him yes but he wasn't 
that coherent at the time. He was just awakening. Yes. And nodded off again. Yes. And at some point, the police officers walked up, correct? <laughs> Said yes. Yes. And um, and then he, uh, well, you woke him up when the police officers walked up, correct? Yes. And so then he was awake. Yes, you just want me to say yes or no, explain what he want me to do. Well, explain. I want to explain. Okay, thank you. So he, when I tried to wake him up, he woke up the second time. I said, Floyd, the, the police is here. It's about the $20 bill wasn't real. I kept saying, baby, get up. The police was out. So he looked, and we looked to the right, and he had the police. He tapped on the window with a, with a um, flashlight. And I'm like, Floyd, and so he turned back around again. He's like, what, what? And I was like, baby, that's the police. Open the door, roll down the window, whatever he told him to do. So he looked back, and he inst when, when he seen the man, the man had the gun at the window at the, at, when we looked back to him. So he instantly grabbed the wheel, and he was like, please, please don't kill me. Please, please don't shoot me. Don't shoot me. What did I do? Just tell me what I did. Please don't kill me. Please don't shoot me. And I'm like, Floyd, baby, it's not. You said explain. I'm trying I did, to explain what state he was in, sir. I did. And I, I have to ask some questions. Um, so I'm sorry to cut you off. I really am. So But I want to go back and just cover one thing quick. Because you, where were you sitting in the vehicle? In the back right passenger seat. Okay. And so when officers back came. Back passenger seat. Were there two officers that came to the vehicle? Yes. So one came to the passenger side and one to the driver's side? Yes. So initially you saw one officer to your right on the passenger side, correct? No, I seen, I was up like in, you know, I'm trying to wake him up, so I'm in the middle, like at the time, you know, when the police were there. That's how I was able to see him too, just we both looked at the same time. Yeah. And um, when he was, uh, during this time period, mm -hmm. coming out from Cup Foods and being in the vehicle, mm -hmm. did he complain of shortness of breath at all? No. Uh, did he complain of chest pains at all? No. And other than being sleepy or nodding off a little bit, did he seem no. abnormal to you in any way? Not at all. And did he seem startled when the officer pulled a gun on him? Very. I have nothing further to Thank you. Um, so it, while you were in the car, or prior to getting in the car, Mr. Floyd appeared to you to be normal, correct? Yes. When he got in the car, he fell asleep, correct? We talked for a while, then he fell asleep. And then ultimately, you had to make several efforts to yes. try to wake him up. Yes. I'm not going to Thank you, Ms. Hill. We appreciate you coming in. Uh, you are excused. Thank you. So you can go right out the door. The honor of the defense calls Peter Chang.
raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Have a seat, please. And before you begin, if you could give us your full name, spelling each of your names. Peter Chang. Uh, first name is Peter, P-E-T-E-R. Last name is Chang, C-H-A-N-G. Mr. Nelson. Thank you. Mr. Chang, by whom are you currently employed? I'm employed with the Minneapolis Park Police. Are you a licensed peace officer? Yes. Could you please describe the training and experience that you have uh, to the jury? Uh, training, I went through the Minneapolis uh, Police Academy. Or prior to that, I did the uh, skills for a metropolitan state. Passed my skills, I went to a uh, police academy through Minneapolis. After passing the, I guess, academy, I went through a FTO phase. Is that field training? Yes. Okay. And that consists of five months. After passing that, I went on the street. Okay. And you, uh, have you spent your entire law enforcement career with the Minneapolis Park Police Department? Yes. And how long have you been a licensed peace officer? Uh, about to be my fourth year in August. Okay. Um, were you on duty back on May uh, 25th of 2020 in the, your capacity as a patrol officer for the Park Police? Yes. And did you ultimately respond to a call at approximately 8 o'clock p.m.? To the park, uh, to the Cup Foods store. Yes. And um, can you describe for the jury how it is that you became uh, a part of this incident? I was uh, stationed at a park close by. Uh, I heard three Tony called out that they were taking out one, I believe, and then I heard a lot of background noises, and I heard dispatch asking for assistance. I was one of the closer squads, so I saw self-assigned to that call to assist 320. Now let me ask you is it common for Minneapolis Park Police to assist on calls with the Minneapolis Police Department? Yes. Okay. Um, your jurisdiction generally is within the parks? Uh, yes. However you are uh, able to back up or assist officers with the Minneapolis Police Department, right? Yes, that's correct. Let me ask you uh, one quick question about your experience. Um, you said that you went to the Minneapolis Police Academy, right? Yes. Even though you were looking to become a Minneapolis Park Police officer? Yes. Do the Park Police and the P Minneapolis Police Department, you have the same academy? Yes, yes we do. Do you have the same field training process? I believe so, yes. And then do you um, participate in uh, continuing education in service as a police officer? Uh, yes, we do. Is that also in conjunction with the Minneapolis Police Department? Yes. All right. Now, after you, um, so you, you responded to the Cup Foods location? Yes. And can you describe for the jury initially what you observed and what you did? When I got there, I initially stopped in front of Cup Foods and I observed the two officers, 320, across the street. So I drew my squad across the street and parked. I got on my car, uh, 320, one officer stated they were go four. Uh, I guess got out of the car. I observed, I believe, Officer Kane with one of the individual who I later identified was Floyd. Uh, Floyd was in handcuffs, sitting on the ground, uh, leaning against the wall, and Officer Lane was with two individuals by the car. Now, let me um, ask you quickly, did you know either Officers King or Lane prior to this incident? Uh, no. Okay. Now, um, were you asked to do something at that point? Uh, once I got on my car, Officer uh, King asked me to identify uh, Floyd in our system. So I just went back to our, my squad car and uh, identified Floyd. All right. And what happened next, sir? Uh, once I was in my car identifying Floyd, I was there off the lane and Kane, uh, I guess assisting Floyd towards their car, which was in front of Kafu's. Now, can you describe where, uh, that would be squad 320, correct? I believe so, yes. And can you describe where squad 320 was parked and where you were parked? S 320 was parked in front of, uh, Kafu's. 
they were on the northbound lane facing southbound. And then I was basically across the street on 38th. I believe my the front of my squad car was facing eastbound on 38th towards Dragon Walk. Yeah. Did you then move your squad car? Yes. Once I identified Floyd, I loop because I observed Officer Lane and Kane assisting Floyd to their squad car. I loop my squad car around and parked in front of their car, their squad car. So your cars were sort of nose to nose. Yes. At an angle, though, right? Yes. All right. What happened next? After that, I got on my squad car. I observed Officer Kane and Lane as pinning Floyd against the squad car, so I wanted to go assist. But once I approached them, Officer Lane told me to go watch the car, and I did that. And you did that? Yes. And then were you, um, uh, where did you go in relation to the car? Uh, the car was parked on 38th Street, so I basically went across the street to the car. Okay. And um, what did you do then? Uh, when I approached the car, I observed the two individuals that initially when I arrived, I saw Officer Lane with, uh, I guess, reaching inside the car. And I basically just told them to back away from the car, not reach inside or get anything from the car. So you were monitoring what the two passengers were doing at that time? Yes. Was your attention focused on what Officers King and Lane were doing, or was it focused on what the passengers were doing? It was more focused on the vehicle and the two passengers. Okay. Now, um, at some point, did you observe another squad car arrive? Uh, yes. And can you describe uh, that interaction that you had with those officers? I believe that was Squad 330. They arrived coming westbound at 38th. Uh, they parked in front of the SUV, and I basically just directed them towards 320, which was which they were in front of Vodka Foods. Okay. Um, did you know the officers, either of the officers in Squad 320? No. Excuse I, me, 330. I, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. 330, not 320. No, I probably met Officer Tao a couple of times, but no relationship. Okay. And you'd never met Officer Chauvin prior to that? No. All right. Now, um, what happened next? Uh... At least they went across the street and then I assisted 320. And again, my main focus was just the car and the two individuals. And as uh, Mr. Floyd and the officers were across the street, did you notice any uh, changes in the area? Uh, yeah, as the, the, there was a crowd. And uh, I guess the crowd was becoming more loud and aggressive. A lot of yelling across the street. Did that cause you any concern? Uh, concern for the officer's safety, yes. Did you go over to try to help them? Uh, no, because I asked my child was to watch the car and the two individuals that were by the car. Did you know whether the car had been searched at all by officers? At that time, no. Okay. Were you concerned about that? Yes. Okay. Um, now, as a, I am assuming that on this day you were in a, a uniform similar to what a Minneapolis police officer would wear? Yes. So you were fully uniformed? Yes. Um, with all of the, the duty belt and all of the things that are on the duty belt, right? Yes. Uh, you were driving a marked squad car? Yes. And does your uh, department require you to wear a body-worn camera? Yes. Was your body-worn camera active uh, and recording this event? Yes. Now, um, have you had an opportunity at this point to review the footage that was taken by your body-worn camera? I have. And um, does that appear to be a fair and ac uh, accurate representation of the things you observed? Yes. Now, in terms of as the crowd or the group of people were uh, uh, congregating around Squad 320, did you notice anything in terms of the tone or tenor of the voices of those people? They were uh, very aggressive, yes. aggressive towards the officers, yes. Did the, did the volume increase? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. And so how, how were you reacting? How were you splitting? How were you reacting to that? Uh, yes, I was uh, focused on car, but then it distracts me, and I was concerned for the officer's safety, too, so I just kept an eye on the officers and the car and the individuals, okay. passengers. And if we can just show the 
going to show a couple of parts of your body worn camera and if you just look at the screen in front of you does this appear to uh, be your body worn camera yes and uh, I note uh, at the top right hand corner here there is a date what is the date uh, May 26th uh, six. Of 2020? Yes. And I notice a time here of 11025Z. Do you know what that means? I do not. Okay. Um, are you familiar with Greenwich Mean Time? Uh, no. Oh, okay. So you don't know why the timestamp, you said you were, what time would you originally estimate that you were? Um, dispatched to this call or did, that you assigned to this call? I'll say approximately 8, eight o'clock. Okay. Obviously there's a time difference here uh, that says 1 10 p.m. And you have no idea why that would be. Ah, uh, no. Now, but it does appear to, to be your uh, body-worn camera from that day? Ah, uh, yes. The same thing that you've observed before? Yes. All right. Then, Your Honor, um, I would uh, move to admit uh, exhibit 1054. Subject to the court's prior rulings, 1054 is received. So we're going to watch about three minutes of your uh, body camera here. Permission to publish.
Now, Officer Chang, does that uh, represent that initial interaction that you had with office or with officers King Lane, uh, Mr. Floyd, and the passengers of the vehicle? Yes. All right. And did you then, in fact, uh, use your computer to enter in the um, name of George Floyd? Yes. All right. And um, after you did that, what happened next? Uh, again, I observed Officer Lane and Kane assist uh, George Floyd to their squad car, which was in front of Cup Foods. So I, I uh, slew my squad car around so I could be closer and I uh, got out of the car. And uh, again, I observed Officer Lane and Kane I was pinning Floyd against their squad car. So I went to assist, but once I approached them, Officer Lane told me to go watch the car. All right. I'm going to, um, if we could take this down, Your Honor. And in front of you, officer, I'm uh, again showing you uh, part of your body camera footage. Yes. And it appears to be the same date, same uh, after you've run the information and looped the car around. Yes. And does this video accurately reflect uh, what you saw and ex saw that day? Yes. I would move, Your Honor, for the admission of Exhibit 1055, which is a, an approximately 23-minute, 24-minute part of Mr. Chang's body camera. Subject to the court's prior rulings, 1055 is received. Permission to publish? You may. Okay. 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 Yeah, I want you guys to grab anything from the car, okay? Leave the car alone. Leave the car alone. Yes, sir. All right, now. There's his phone. All right. Just leave the car alone. Okay. How you doing? Good, good, good. Would you guys take out the car? Cigarettes. Cigarettes? You got your personal items? This is mine. I had it in my hand. This is my phone. Okay. His phone in there. Whose car is this? That's his friend's car. A female name. Um, I was trying to think of the girl's name. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Who is he to you guys? Uh, that's my ex. Your ex, okay. And I just seen him in the store, so he was gonna give me a ride home. Okay. I just came to get my phone fixed. Didn't give it her a Her and I try to get us okay, just stay put, all right? I don't want anybody near his car. Is anybody gonna check my name? Because I, my daughter on her way here to get me. All right, where's the ID? I don't have it. I gave my All right, number. why don't you stand right there, okay? They know who gave them the money and whatnot. So okay. 320, can you repeat that? She has to give my partners their names or no? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we are there. Yeah, Zed? Okay. Did he write it down? Uh, yep. You wrote down everything? Okay, stay put, all right? Let's see what my partner does. Damn, he still won't get in the car. Just sit down, dude. Dude, they got to push him in this car. Look, he's fighting to get out. What is he doing? Now he's going to jail. All you 
Can y'all give him his phone, though, please? We'll see what happens, all right? You guys just stay put until what? Tell my partner's come back here. You guys don't have your IDs on you? I already gave him one, man. Huh? I gave it to him, man. Why don't I see your ID again? I gave it to him. He has your ID? Yeah. And I gave him my name because I didn't even okay. a purse or nothing. All right, just well, just stay put here, okay? Bed. I know one damn thing. Y'all better go ask Mike because it wasn't up. Okay. Yeah, okay. I stay far the back there, okay? Huh? Let's stay far the back. What's, what's her name? My name's Shawanda. Shawanda? Yeah. What's yours? What's your name? Ricardo. William Ricardo, sir. What is it? William Ricardo. Ricardo? Yeah. All right. <coughs> hey, Okay, well, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. They gave me some too. I tore that shit up. Give you some white. Pay money, man. Who the gave it to you? Somebody, I don't know whoever the fuck asked for change or something to get some fuck ass. See, reading the man told me, hey, that's fake. All right, cool. You see, my, I told him, right, right. And he came out and started telling that it. dude, yeah. And I told him, the dude told him, and he told him to come back in the pub, come back in our, in our, in our, in our store. But he so was, he was talking. to figure it out. Yeah, he was like, what the fuck? Why would I, where I'm going to get some fake money from? Ricardo, how are, you, how are you if related to Floyd? How you know him? A, he used to do security work at the Salvation Army, man. How are you? How do you know him? I don't know him. I'm telling you how. Right there. He okay. Security work. So how are you guys together then? We was getting a ride. Yeah. Her and I was getting oh, okay, so you two are together. No. I seen him in the store too, but that's my ex. You okay. know what I'm saying? How are you? How, are you, how, how do I you two know each other? How do, how do you not know him when he said he's with you? No, he, they, he was getting a ride from him too, and he told me, come on, and he'll give me a ride. Okay, okay, just stay put then. Well, I don't need it, because my daughter goes. All right, that's good. Is this her right here? I'll right, stay put, all right? He's making it more difficult. Right. Uh, damn, that's He's making it more difficult. I know. I think you guys 
shot. He got he was because he was falling asleep a little bit, and then when I woke up, they was up at the door. Officer, do you see the uh, individual on the left hand walking by? Uh, yes. Um, you had no interaction with her at this point? No. You'd agree that this is at 123 and 17Z of your body camera footage? Yes. Though, but, uh, Mr. Adam in the store for probably for me. me too. Adam. I, paid, I spent my money. Adam. I paid for Adam. my phone. I was getting a, a laptop and it didn't work, so he gave me my phones back. Okay. You can come in and talk to him. Okay, sure. You mind if I get my little mask? Where is mind. it? What is it? Man. Where is it? Right here, uh, go ahead. Huh? Go ahead. Let's make it quick. Face me. Huh? Face me. That's good. If you guys are gonna, you guys are on the warrants or nothing. Then after all this is settled, you guys are good to go out. All this is settled. Can't I just ask him? Oh, wait. So, don't you hear your friend talking? Hey, yelling over there? To, oh I can see him yelling and talking. Can't He's making talk to, the, to the store person? Well, I'm waiting for my partners. Yeah, Got to talk to my partner and see what's up. Floyd, you know Floyd? Yeah, yeah I'm talking about, I know the people in the store very well. Okay, that's good. 12 is the closest available if you can start for an assault at next door to 2313 Washington Street, Northeast. There's a black male approaching the female. Officer, I'm just going to look right here at the door. Just see if I left any right here. All right, let's get, that's it, man, Ricardo. Just the door, all right? Yeah. Nobody's come close to us, so right now we don't need a mask yet. Huh? So right now nobody's come close to us, so we're good with the mask. Oh, that's his, that he called her? Did he call her? Did Floyd call her? Huh? Is it a white girl? Yeah. yeah. She's short. Yeah, right here. Stay put, guys. All right? I want to be involved in that. They did something for All right, let's stay here, all right? All right, they did something for them. They did something for them. They did something for them. They did Stay put here. All right, tell my partners and them done over there that they can figure things out. We'll figure things out, right? Right now, we're grabbing an ambulance for your buddy, for Florida, okay? Oh, uh, So he might have hurt himself. They hurt him? He might have hurt himself. Oh, all right? God. Who knows? Hey, 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 man. Something happened. The ambulance here, everything. Can I just see what no, y'all did this, to him? Shawana? He on the ground and everything. 
Just stay over here, okay? Stay on the ground. Yes. Where? Right here. Shawanda. What was that? I said, y'all go one in the store, guys. Okay, let's stay put. We'll figure it out, right, Ricardo? Oh my God. I'm not giving you guys any Why problems, right? Why is he going to the hospital? Oh, man. Shawana, you're not helping. I'm just trying to figure out. Once our partners get over here, they can explain to you guys, okay? We got a make on the vehicle and with a tan. I'll try and get that. Oh, it's gonna be out of the way. Where's his phone? Where's his phone? It's in the car. We'll take the car, okay? Nope, I don't want you reaching a car, okay? It's right there on the seat. He'll get to his car once he's done with that, okay? His car is not going anywhere. Don't go into the car. I don't want you guys going to the car. That's it. Well, once my partners come over here, you guys can ask, right? What? Just go straight, man. It's tight here. You guys good? Oh. I don't know. Uh, Officer Chang, uh, pausing the video for a second, you'd agree that the ambulance appears to be leaving at 13021Z on your body worn cam? Yes. Here's a book, man. Yeah, are you guys good with diesel? I'm gonna double check. Here's a book. Here's a notebook. Yeah, in the car. Yeah, it's right down. His phone. He's already gone. He doesn't need his phone. Is that his phone? Yeah. Put his phone back. Yeah, put his phone back. He's gonna. Have to He's gone already. He went to hospital. Tell him where it is. Are you sure? Yeah. Put his phone back. That's it. You know I'm wrong. Yeah. Okay. What's up? You might have called his family or something. Now I watch the old family out. I ain't even. What happened? You know, I, I, so. I didn't talk to them yet. You heard it. Okay. Did you, okay. Did you so. ran him though? Nope. Oh, no, that you. man took yeah. our name. So, you supposedly, your partner has his ID. What happened to him? He fucked up, man. All right. That's they fucked him up. That's a partner of your partner's in the order. He fucked up. 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 They kept his foot on his neck. They kept his foot on his neck. I don't even know what happened. So, what? I tried to get him to get in the car. I tried. I told him he can't win. Go on, get in the car. I kept telling him that. Okay. You can't win, bro. Get in the car. Because I know you can't win. I don't need anything from them. They're good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you guys are good. Okay, thank you. The two things I don't fuck with well, well, he said you two are good, but I'm not too sure about this. Can I take Sylvia on What? That's Sylvia's truck. That's our friend, Sylvia. Okay. Ex co worker. Well, let me try. If I get her phone, I can call her and tell her, sir. Oh, well, the car is going to stay put right here until we figure it out. Well, you better lock it because it's phone sitting right there. Can I oh, tell oh. Sylvia? Just stay put. Yeah. My partner's going to come back. I don't know. I don't know what the plan is with the car. Hey, you might 
mind if I can just get his phone? Okay. I don't want you guys touching the car. Officer Chang, you'd agree that the uh, timestamp on your body worn camera when the fire truck arrives is 132 and 50 seconds Z, correct? Yes. I didn't hear anybody call the fire. Different call? I think this car, I think, well, I got here, they were, the doors were open, so they're involved, but I don't, I don't so. Is he on his tendons? Or, no, I think it's, they're gone. Okay. Are you still red? Is that? You're still red? Oh. Yeah, I'm still. Yeah. Uh, if you could let MFD know that EMS needs the fire chief to go to parking 36 station in the full rest house. It's also parking 36. I don't say so. You're not a bad one. You're good. You're good. You're if you advise the fire department if they're still with you, they need to go to 36th and park with this with a few of the rest. No, 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 I got to get in the car. I got to get in the car. I got to get in the car. Yeah, I got to get in the car. I got to get in the car. Officer Chang, you'd agree that uh, now the fire truck appears to be leaving, correct? Yes. Timestamp on your video is 13506Z, correct? Yes. Our subject to the court's ruling. Now, a few follow up questions here, Officer Chang, for you. Um, it seems to me that you're walking around quite a bit. Can you explain why? Uh, it's pacing back for just to make sure that. I was, again, I was concerned for the officer safety because of the crowd. So I just want to make sure that the officers were okay. Did you observe other people at other locations besides where Mr. Floyd and the officers were? Uh, you could say at least one at every corner of the intersection. Did you observe people standing um, in the Speedway parking lot? Oh, uh, yes. And there were one or two people on the corner where you guys were? Yes. Um, and at least one person across the street uh, to the west, right? Yes. Southwest corner. Now, in terms of um, the general area, would you describe that as a pretty busy intersection? Uh, yes, traffic and foot traffic, yeah. So a fair number of cars, vehicles traveling through that intersection? Yes. As well as a fair number of people on bikes or on foot walking past? Yes. All right. Um, ultimately, uh, did this pretty much end your involvement in this case? Yes, that's correct. So you, you pretty much uh, went back to your regular duties with the park police, correct? Yes. All right. Based on that, Your Honor, I have no further questions. Cross-examination.
Good morning, Officer Chang. Good morning. Just, just a few follow-up questions for you. Um, in the video we just watched, um, at one point when you were talking with Officer Tao, it sounded to me like you you asked him, still red? Yes. What is that what you said? Yes. What does that mean? Uh, if his body camera is still on. And so you were asking him if his was on? Yeah. And that's because yes. you had yours on still? Yes. And so, Officer Chang, when you're working for the Minneapolis Park Police, um, you go through the academy with um, city police recruits, correct? Yes. Um, and at that point, when you're going through the academy, do you know whether you're going to end up in the park police or the city police? Uh, when you first start the academy, you already know who. <coughs> sorry, you already know who you're. Yes, working for yes. So, as far as you know, those recruits, you, know, you could be working with them someday in the future. Uh, I guess on a straight. I mean, we if we patrol the same area or precinct, yes, but. Right, but when you start, you could end up being a city officer just like them. Uh, no. Okay. So when initially when you first start, I guess you already get the offer from the employer. Sorry, receive the offer from uh, Minneapolis Park Police prior to starting the academy. Okay, now I got it. So when you're in the academy, you know you're going to be Park Police and the others may be City Police. Yes. All right. But when you get out there on the streets, um, while you monitor the parks, you also have authority to assist with calls outside of the parks. Yes. So in terms of an average shift, let's say, you know, how often do you do this where you assist on a city police call? Not often, unless we're close by. Unless, uh, we don't, I guess there's no calls at the parks, but we pretty much keep us so busy with the park system. But if, but you know, if, if you self-assign to help a city uh, call, you're not gonna get in trouble from your supervisor for that? No. Because okay. that's all you know, part of your responsibilities, you're allowed to do that. Yes. And in fact, when you're doing that, when you're working in the park police, you have the same um, radio traffic, you're able to hear the same radio traffic as um, the city police officers. Yes. Um, and in fact, I think we heard you refer to the city officers here as your partners, correct? Yes. So when you're there, you look to them as you know, your partners in working this scene. Yes. And you would suspect that they feel the same way about you, I assume. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, and um, with this particular call, um, you heard a, a request for backup, right, on this call? Yes. Um, and because you heard some noise in the background, uh, you decided initially to go lights and sirens. Yes. And, and to self-assign, I think, was the term you used. Yes. Okay. And um, at some point, though, on your way there, you turned off your lights and sirens, right? Yes. Okay. And that was before you actually arrived? Yes. And when you arrived, um, I think we even heard, um, as you're pulling up, the officers already assigned call code 4, correct? Yes. And what is your understanding, or back on May 25th, of 2020, what was your understanding about what code four means? Uh, scene safety. So it's under control, correct? Yes. All right. And when you got there, um, you got out of your squad car, correct? Yes. And you see two city officers. Yes. And um, one who you later find out is Officer King. Yes. Is speaking with Mr. Floyd. Yes. And Mr. Floyd is sitting on the sidewalk against the dragon walk. Yes. He doesn't appear to be threatening in any way at that time, does he? Uh, no. Doesn't appear to be agitated or upset in any way at that time? Uh, no. So right there sitting on the sidewalk, he was pretty peaceful? Yes. And um, when that happened, um, you never heard the officers call for a code three to other officers responding? No. 
So they did not call the code three, correct? No. That's <laughs> we're doing this question thing. Um, you heard later there was a call for code three on the ambulance, the EMS, correct? Yes. But there was never a call for code three for the responding officers. I don't believe so, no. And um, when you arrived and got out, I assume you were trained to assess the situation, correct? Yes. And you did that as you're getting out of your squad car? Yes. And um, when you did that, did you hear Officer King ask Mr. Floyd for his name? I did, yes. And you heard Mr. Uh, Floyd give his full name? Yes. Spell it? Yes. And his date of birth? I believe so, yes. And then you were asked to run that through your system and, and you were able to do that, correct? Yes. So, um, then you um, observed as the officers, Lane and King, walked Mr. Floyd over to their squad car, correct? Yes. And that's when you decided to move your squad car over to, to that area, correct? Yes. And your intention there was to help those two officers with what they were doing? Correct. But as soon as you got out, they asked you to go watch the scene by the, the dragon walk with the two passengers? Yes. And you did that. You then walked back over to that location? Yes. And once you walked back over there, you really couldn't see what was going on with officers Lane and King and Mr. Floyd in front of the cup foods. I believe at that time they were still, I mean, still had Floyd against the car. Yeah. I, I believe during that time, yes. Okay, so against the driver's side of their squad car. I believe so, yes. Um, but um, once you walked over to the far side of the road, over by the Dragon Walk, you could no longer see what was going on with Mr. Floyd. He, yeah, yes. You uh, indicated that um, the crowd was getting uh, louder and uh, more aggressive, correct? Yes. And, um, but you knew that there were now four officers over at that scene, correct? Correct, yes. And so your main focus was on watching those passengers? Yes, in a car. And you assumed when you were doing that, that those four officers were okay over there because there were four of them, correct? Yes. And if they had radioed for help, you would have heard it over your radio? Yes. And they never radioed for help, did they? No. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Anything further? Thank you. You're excused. Thank you. Members of the jury, we're going to take a 10-minute break while we check the availability of the next witness. It'll probably be our last break before uh, we break for lunch. And Council of Chambers?
Mr. Nelson, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor, for the record, the defense recalls uh, Officer Nicole McKenzie. And let's have you state and spell your full name again uh, so the court reporter has it. Nicole, N I C O L E, last name McKenzie, M A C K E N Z I E. Yeah, Mr. Nelson. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Miss McKenzie. Good morning. Awesome. Officer, I apologize. I, I'm sorry. Um, you've previously testified in this case, correct? I have. And uh, just to refresh the jury's recollection, what is your uh, role again with the Minneapolis Police Department? I'm the medical support coordinator for the department. Okay. And in terms of... Could you, could you take your mask down? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the training that you provide to officers, uh, fair to say that the training consists of both academy training and uh, veteran officer training called in-service. Yes, sir. And in terms of uh, the training that your department provides, does your department provide excited delirium training to officers in the academy? In the academy, yes. And that's not something that routinely is given to the veteran officers? Correct. All right. Now, you understand that uh, Officer Lane, who is a part of this case, recently attended the academy. Correct, yes. And um, he would have seen the materials that the Minneapolis Police Department provided relevant to excited delirium. Yes, sir. And you've had an opportunity and you've reviewed the PowerPoint presentations that are prepared in that regard? I have. Do you want the instruction? Members of the jury, uh, you're about to receive evidence regarding excited delirium training that was received by Officer Lane at the police academy. This is being offered for the limited purpose of explaining why he used the phrase excited delirium on May 25th, 2020, and what that meant to him. This is not being offered as state of mind or knowledge of the defendant, since we have no indication in the record that this defendant, Mr. Chauvin, uh, took this training. So accept it only for that limited purpose regarding Officer Lane. Mr. Nelson. Thank you. So just uh, going to show you, uh, this has been pre-marked as Exhibit 1053. Does this appear to be the uh, training materials the Minneapolis Police Department provides for officers or cadets in the academy? It does. Um, does it, and just skipping through, does this appear to be a accurate uh, copy of that? It appears to be so. And I'll just kind of scan through fast. To be pretty much the entirety of that training? It looks like it, yes. Okay. And um, can you just describe for the jury generally what excited delirium is as you train it? Certainly. It's uh, a condition that's a combination of a variety of different medical um, uh, issues that are happening at the same time. This could be something like psychosis. Um, um, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, agitated, uh, agitated delirium. Um, it could be uh, a pressurized speech, incoherent speech, um, superhuman strength, hyperthermia, they could all be present. Okay. And um, does the Minneapolis Police Department train cadets? What types of things cause excited delirium? In a general sense, yes. Okay. It's a combination of uh, pre-existing factors. It could be cardiovascular disease, 
um, also illicit drug use, and also mental health um, diagnoses. Okay. And in terms of um, the uh, signs that officers are trained to look for, could you describe what those are? Yeah, we do use an acronym um, to correlate with that, and we use the acronym of not a crime. Um, so there's a varying different things you might see if somebody's presenting with excited delirium, um, like the person, because they are experiencing um, hyperthermia, meaning excessive temperature, uh, they might be removing their clothing, they might be speaking incoherently. Um, whether it's a bystander or the caller, uh, they might describe the person had just snapped. Um, it, and if I could reference my materials, I can go through a little more in detail. Um, so for purposes and subject to the state's objection, the, the defense moves to introduce Exhibit 1053. Subject to the court's rulings, uh, 1053 is received. Uh, you see uh, the first uh, letter of your acronym, not a crime, before you? Yes. And um, what does that stand for? Uh, the patient might present as naked or sweating, removing their clothing. Okay. And the second slide being, or excuse me, the next uh, letter being O? Yes, and that's objects, exhibiting violence towards objects. Okay. A T? Is tough and unstoppable. And that's what you described as like superhuman strength? Yes, sir. A? The onset is acute. What does that and, mean? And that's where somebody will say the patient just snapped. Okay. So it's rapid or fast? Right. C? Uh, the patient is confused. Might be speaking incoherently. R? Resistant. And define that? Um, that the person will likely not be able to, uh, they don't have the capability about them to respond to commands um, to comply. Okay. And I? Incoherent. And how would you define incoherent in this sense? Um, if somebody's like experiencing some level of psychosis, they might be talking about complete nonsense. Their words just don't even make sense. Um, and there's really no dialogue you can have with them, meaningful dialogue you can have with a person. Okay. And M? Uh, that'd be mental health. The person uh, or callers have some kind of information that leads to believe there's some mental health issues going on. Okay. And E? and that EMS should be requested early. Okay. It's fair to say that if an officer uh, suspects um, excited delirium as occurring with a suspect, there are certain steps that they are encouraged to do, correct? Correct. Um, can you define what an officer should do if they encounter a suspect they suspect is suffering from excited delirium? Uh, definitely get more resources started because you might need more resources than you would think and then also having EMS stage um, at a safe distance away okay. until the situation is under control. And obviously um, attempt to control the subject? Correct. Through physical restraint? Yes. Uh, it's fair to say that once a person is in handcuffs under the excited delirium uh, you train officers to put that suspect in the recovery position, agreed? Correct. And what would be the purpose of um, bringing EMS on scene? Uh, because people that are experiencing the excited delirium syndrome, uh, they can rapidly go into cardiac arrest. You train uh, Minneapolis police cadets, correct? Correct. Now, again, as far as veteran officers, they may not see this particular training materials, correct? They would not. And but is is excited delirium a subject that is discussed in in-service trainings generally? It has been in the past, but that was not with the medical support team. And so, in terms of use of force or other questions, or other areas of training. Correct. Okay, um, Your Honor, I have no further questions. Mr. Frank. Thank you, Your Honor. Officer McKenzie, I have just a few follow-up questions for you. Um, so the, the basic training 
an uh, excited delirium with cadets or recruits um, is to is what to look for. Correct. And then secondly, what things they can do. Correct. And one of the things that they are told to do is to put the person in the side recovery position, correct? That is correct. And that's to help facilitate breathing. Yes. Because excited delirium, if it exists, uh, could compromise proper breathing. It, absolutely, yes. And officers, uh, both in the academy and veteran officers, are trained on CPR. Yes. And so um, they are also trained that they have an obligation if someone becomes pulseless or unresponsive to initiate measures such as CPR. Yes, sir. And that would be true of, as I said, veteran officers as well, correct? Correct. It's our policy. And um, cadets like uh, Officer Lane received CPR training, correct? Yes, sir. And an officer like uh, Mr. Chauvin would have received CPR training on a regular basis. Yes. You were asked about the acronym uh, to help identify potential markers of this condition. Yes. Um, would you um, defer to an emergency room doctor uh, on whether someone is actually experiencing excited delirium. Absolutely. It's not our place to diagnose that. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Anything further? Thank you, Officer. Uh, you are excused now. Thank you. Your next witness is available after lunch. What time? Uh, 12.30, 12.45. Right, members of the jury, we're going to take our lunch break and uh, let's reconvene at one fifteen. We'll see you then.
Mr. Nelson, you may call your next witness. Your Honor, at this time the defense calls Barry Broad. Swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Please. If you would. Thank you. And if you could begin, uh, let's make sure the microphone is pointed towards you a little bit. There we go. If you could begin by giving us your full name, spelling each of your names. Barry Vance Broad, B A R R Y V A N C E B R O D D. -D. Mr. Nelson. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Mr. Brown. Afternoon. Uh, are you currently employed? I am. And where are you so employed? I'm self-employed as I own a consulting company, BVB and Associates. And uh, what do you, what areas uh, do you consult in? Uh, police practices and use of force. All right. Now, uh, did you have a career as a police officer prior to starting your company? I did. Can you, for the jury, please describe generally your education that you received in order to become a police officer? So I have a bachelor's degree in law enforcement from George Mason University, which is in Fairfax, Virginia. I have a California Community College teaching credential from San Francisco State University. And I'm a graduate of the Labor Management Relations Program at University of California at Davis. Okay. And uh, did you serve as a licensed police officer in various capacities? I did. When did you start your law enforcement career? So when I graduated college, I was a seasonal police officer in Ocean City, Maryland. Then I was a deputy sheriff for six months with the Onta County Sheriff's Office in Arlington, Virginia, assigned to the custody division. Then I was hired by the United States Park Police, which is a law enforcement branch of the Department of Interior. Is that a federal law enforcement agency? That is a federal law enforcement agency. Okay. And I started my career with the Park Police in Washington, D.C., and then I was transferred to San Francisco Field Office in 1977. Then I went on loan to an undercover drug task force in Marin County, California, and then I went to Santa Rosa Police Department in 1982. And how long were you with the Santa Rosa Police Department then? 22 years. I had 29 years total law enforcement experience. All right. Um, in your capacity as a police officer, do you have any specialized training or experience? I did. And what is that? So I had special assignments as with the Park Police. I was certified by the FBI as a defensive tactics instructor in 1978. I started teaching in the Santa Rosa Public Safety Training Center, and I also taught law enforcement rangers throughout the western region of the National Park Service. Can you explain um, what defensive tactic tactics is generally? So when you look at the topic of use of force, that could include handcuffing, hands-on techniques, baton techniques, handcuffing, pain compliance, and under the use of force umbrella, there's also firearms, but I focused almost entirely on the defensive tactics portion of use of force. And so um, you, you testified that you taught defensive tactics at, you called it the, uh, I believe, the Regional Training Center? Uh, it's, it is a regional academy, but the official name is the Santa Rosa Public Safety Training Center. Can you and, describe what that is? So a uh, recruit police officer would attend the training center for their California Post Basic Academy certification. Um, National Park Service Rangers also attended that academy. Corrections officers attend that academy. Probation officers. And there's also a EMS component. Firefighters go to that academy and it also services in-service training. In-service is uh, training for uh, licensed officers? Yes. To meet their continuing education credits? Yes. And how long did you teach there? 35 years. Uh, in the use of force always? Yes. 
in were, addition to other topics. What were the other topics that you trained? Uh, weapons laws, interview and interrogation techniques, um, collision scene preservation, uh, verbal judo, tactical communication skills, or some of the others. What, what's verbal judo? So it is actually a, Dr. George Thompson developed the program shortly after the Rodney King incident, thinking that police officers needed better tools to communicate with people. So verbal judo created an outline on how an officer who would make a traffic stop could use verbal skills to overcome a person's potential noncompliance. Did you also um, teach or uh, in crowd control, crowd management type issues? I did. So well, the topics I taught at the training center was defensive tactics, crowd control, chemical agent, impact weapons, and a variety of the other topics that I just discussed earlier. Okay. And so you did that for 35 years while you were still uh, actively a peace officer? So I taught while I was a police officer, and then when I retired in 2004, I continued teaching in the training center for another nine years. All right. Do you have uh, any, have you received any certifications throughout the course of your career? Uh, several. Can you describe for the jury some of the certifications that you've hold, held? So I have a post basic, intermediate, and advanced certificates. And then as far as instructor certifications, I was certified by the FBI as a defensive tactics instructor. I was certified by the California Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission as a defensive tactics instructor. And through California Post, I was also an impact weapon instructor, chemical agent instructor, less lethal munition instructor, verbal judo instructor, pepper spray instructor, to name, I can't remember them all. Okay. Um, do you, so can you describe the nature of your uh, private practice, so to speak, in terms of the use of force? Um, I take cases from plaintiffs and defendants in civil cases and criminal cases. I do use of force consulting for a variety of public defenders offices in California. And I was also a member of the, I was a use of force consultant for the San Francisco Disc Attorney's Office. Okay. Have you um, been involved in prior cases to review the uses of force? I've had a little bit over 140 cases that I was actively involved in. Okay. Have you provided testimony in courts uh, throughout the United States? I have or other arbitrative type civil hearings? Yes. Can you uh, tell me the number of times that you've testified in either civil or criminal cases? So since 2016, I've testified in court, either criminal or civil, both state and federal, 10 times. Um, and in terms of other types of hearings, depositions, uh, things of that nature, do you testify there as well? Yes. Um, can you describe some of the states where you have previously uh, testified? Uh, Illinois, California, Hawaii, and that's about it. Have you ever been hired on a case here in Minnesota? Yes. And who hired you in that particular case? Uh, Minneapolis City Attorney's Office. Now you're being paid for your services, correct? Yes. You tell the jury your hourly rate and the number of hours you've uh, spent on this case. I've spent roughly 60 hours. I make $350 an hour for courtroom appearances and $275 an hour for case reviews. And how much have you, uh, what's the total about you've earned so far? Uh, in this case, $11,400. Now, simply because you're being paid does that mean you're going to always buy a particular party? Does that mean you're always going to side with that party? No. In your career, have you ever uh, been retained by someone and found their use of force to be improper? On several times. How is it that you became involved in this particular case? When this incident first occurred, I reached out to the city attorney's office here in Minneapolis, told them that I had some 
I had some exposure to the George Floyd incident and I was offering my services to the Minneapolis City Attorney's Office. And you were ultimately not retained by the City Attorney's Office or the state, correct? That's correct. Um, you then were retained by my uh, office? Yes. Okay. When you were retained, did I, were you provided with a scope of your engagement? I was. Could you explain for the jury the scope of your engagement in this particular case? You asked me to analyze the actions of Derek Chauvin and give opinions regarding his conduct and actions towards Mr. Floyd. Okay. Can you describe the materials that you reviewed uh, in order to analyze this case? So I received thousands of pages of materials, but I've learned through my experience that I don't need to review materials that really don't have anything to do with the officer or the officer's policies or the use of force policies. So I pretty much focused my review on the videos, the snapshots of the body ward cameras that the officers were wearing, uh, miscellaneous statements, the use of force policies, and training records. So when you say there were some materials that were not relevant to your analysis, can you just kind of give a general example of what that would be? Uh, horse mounted patrol responsibilities, um, vehicle maintenance responsibilities, things of that nature. Okay. But anything pertaining directly to your analysis in this case, you did review? I did review. Okay. Now, based upon uh, your training and experience and your expertise in the use of uh, force matters, um, your review of the materials that have been provided to you, have you formed opinions in this particular case to a reasonable, de reasonable degree of professional certainty? I have. And can you just briefly overview your opinions in this particular case? I felt that Derek Chauvin was justified and was acting with objective reasonableness following Minneapolis Police Department policy and current standards of law enforcement and his interactions with Mr. Floyd. Okay. Um, we've heard a lot over the last couple of weeks about the Graham versus Connor factors. Are you familiar with the Graham versus Connor factors? I am. And can you just very briefly um, uh, provide your definition and your uh, how you look at those factors? So in my 35 years of teaching, it's not just dealing with tactics, but it's dealing with providing an officer the mindset that what they need to justify to use various tactics that they were trained in. And the standard of Graham versus Connor is, you know, what would a reasonable officer have done in a similar set of circumstances that you're doing? Now, the Graham versus Connor factor is the first one is the severity of the crime at issue, correct? Yes. How do you analyze that? Graham versus Connor factor. So I know in my experience and the experience of officers that I've been in contact with is that the higher risk an arrest may be, like say an armed bank robber. You know, armed bank robber, you would pull your gun, order them to the ground to take them into custody. Okay, you know their danger, you know their threat level right off the bat. Whereas I can't imagine how many times I've been exposed to personally or have seen other officers dealing with a simple thing as a traffic stop or a jaywalking violation or some minor offense and they end up in a fight for their life just because of the conduct of the individual they're contacting. Okay. So in terms of the severity of issue, is it always what was the initial response in your per or or is it something that evolves over time? Well, the initial response, of course, is important, but it's really how the person you're interacting with as a law enforcement officer responds to you. Okay. And that's, it, does that go into the second Graham factor? It the, does, the imminent threat. Right. And can you just explain the imminent threat factor? So imminent is, from a police officer standpoint, you don't have to wait for it to happen. You just have to have a reasonable fear that somebody's either going to strike you, stab you, shoot you. So you try to plan to deal with the imminent threat. 
and then you adjust your tactics accordingly based upon how the suspect is reacting to you. Okay. And the third gram uh, factor is whether the suspect is actively resisting or attempting to evade, correct? That's correct. Right. And can you explain that to the jury? So again, the level of resistance is commensurate with how they resist you justifies an officer to use a variety of tools on their tool belt. So if a suspect is resisting your efforts to handcuff them and they spin away and try to punch you, an officer doesn't have to go fist on fist with them. The officer is allowed to escalate to use an impact weapon, taser, pepper spray, or other tools. Now, in terms of, again, the, um, the analysis of Graham versus fa of Connor, are there other factors or components of that analysis that are relevant? Yes. Can you explain some of those? So as you're reviewing an incident such as this, you have to try to see it through the eyes of the officers on the scene. You know, what factors were they dealing with? What circumstances? What was the suspect doing? What were onlookers doing? Were there environmental hazards? And then try to put yourself in the officer's shoes to see what they, the decisions they made, were they objectively reasonable or not? So it's, you would agree with the other uh, people who've testified in this case that the standard involves objective reasonableness, agree? Yes, I do. Based on the totality of facts and circumstances of this case. That were present to the officer at the time. And a view from a reasonable police officer on the scene. Yes. And what, a, what about hindsight? So it's easy to sit and judge in an office on an officer's conduct. It's more of a challenge to, again, put yourself in the officer's shoes to try to make an evaluation through what they're feeling, what they're sensing, the fear they have, and then make a determination. And does that prohibit or preclude a review of a police officer's conduct? No, not a review, no. Now, when you approach a uh, use of force case such as this, do you apply a particular methodology in order to, uh, in order to analyze the Graham versus Connor factors? I do. And can you explain for the jury the methodology that you've used in your previous cases or in your career? So it's a pretty simple review. So I look at when the officer contacted the individual, did the officer have legal authority for a detention? So let's talk about a traffic stop. If somebody runs a stop sign, police officer has the right to detain you to a citation. You as the person running the stop sign doesn't have the right to resist the officer. So anything that would have evolved from a lawful detention, the officer has certain rights to continue the investigation. Now, a detention can, so detention you need reasonable suspicion for. To make an arrest, you need probable cause. So when I'm looking at use of force cases, I want to make sure that the officer had a, lethal, a lawful right to detain or probable cause to arrest. And um, in terms of the uh, lawful right to detain, you used a term. What was that term? Reasonable suspicion? Reasonable suspicion to detain. And what constitutes generally reasonable suspicion to detain? That you see an infraction or a misdemeanor or a felony and the person that you're going to detain, you have a reasonable suspicion that they've committed an infraction or another crime. And in terms of probable cause to arrest, how would you define that? It's pretty much as the statement says that the person probably committed the crime. And so officers, when they make an arrest, they base it on probable cause. So in terms of um, putting a suspect in handcuffs, is that automatically an arrest? No. It, can it be a detention? It could be a detention. So the first, just to make sure I understand uh, your testimony, your first prong of your analysis is to determine whether the officer had justification to detain the suspect, correct? Yes. What's the second part of your analysis? Now, how does the suspect respond to the officer? If it's an arrest situation and the officer tells the suspect to turn around, put your hands behind your back or behind your head, and the suspect complies, and the officer handcuffs the suspect, that's good. If the suspect 
doesn't comply and they begin to resist, then I look at what level of the resistance did the suspect display to the officer and then what did the officer do to overcome that resistance. Now let's talk briefly in the second prong about the different types of uh, resistance that a suspect could uh, use. Can you describe the levels of resistance that you look for? So no resistance would be compliance. That's always the goal. Uh, the next level would be passive resistance where a suspect, you tell the suspect to turn around, put their hands behind their back and they don't. They're not resisting you. They're just being physically non-compliant yet without any type of physical strength or any type of maneuvers that they may try to do to prevent you from handcuffing them. So the next level would be active resistance. So I go to put you into a handcuffing position and you pull your hands away or you struggle with me. So that's active resistance where they're using energy to prevent an officer from accomplishing their goal. And then now that same suspect who I want to handcuff pulls away from me and they swing at me. So that's active aggression. And all those cues are allowing me to start escalating up the ladder of force options I have available to me. Now, in terms of um, your experience um, in various jurisdictions, do use of force policies differ from city to city, state to state? They differ slightly. Um, Usually deadly force policies are fairly consistent. Um, some agencies have more liberal use of force policies than others. Um, some agencies now are starting to adopt policies that you can't shoot at a moving vehicle if the only weapon is the vehicle itself. So there's a little bit of a learning curve there for agencies. Okay. So in terms of your, um, again, analysis, the first prong being whether there was a justification for the detention, the second prong being um, the level of resistance exhibited by the suspect, correct? Yes. What's the third prong? What the officer did to overcome that resistance. So if somebody pulls away from you and they're actively resisting, does the officer pull out their baton and strike them in the head? That to me would be excessive. So was the officer's use of force proportionate to the level of resistance demonstrated by the suspect? Objectively reasonable, correct? Yes. All right. So in terms of your three-part analysis, did you apply that analysis to this case? I did. In your opinion, was this a use of deadly force? It was not. Can you explain that? So I'll give you an example that I used to teach my academy classes. So. Officers respond to a domestic violence situation and the suspect is still there and he fights with the sus he's, excuse me, he fights with the officers and the officers are justified in using a taser to overcome this person's noncompliance. They tase the individual and the individual falls to the ground, strikes their head and dies. So that isn't an incident of deadly force. That's an incident of an accidental death. And in my review, I would look to see whether the suspect's resistance to justify the use of the taser was objectively reasonable. Can you, um, can you describe what you would call control techniques? So control techniques are me putting my hands on you. And it could be you know, escort position where I put my hand above your elbow and my hand on your wrist. It could be pain compliance techniques, which means I'm doing some joint manipulation on various parts of your body. And if you're doing what I'm asking you to do, it doesn't hurt. If you don't do what I'm asking you to do, I can motivate your compliance through pain compliance, stimulating you with pain. Now, in terms of your analysis of any case, you, um, I think you described this a little bit, but you, did you refer to kind of an increase of level of force to overcome the resistance? How would you describe that? Uh, police terminology is called one-upmanship. So, you know, police officers don't have to fight fair. 
they're allowed to overcome your resistance by going up a level or resorting to a different force option to let them accomplish the goal of getting you to comply. Are officers also required to de-escalate in certain circumstances? Yes. And, and can you describe the process of moving up or down that use of force? And it really, it's always in response to what a suspect is doing. So if they're fighting, you're fighting back. You're trying to control them. Once they're controlled, you reduce your justified levels of force, yet you're still in control of the person. Anybody you take into custody, you have to maintain control of. Again, in terms of the use of force, what relevance does possible drug influence have in an analysis? Has quite a large impact in my opinion. How so? Well, because people on the influence of drugs may not be hearing what you're trying to ask them to do. They may not understand. They may have erratic behavior. They may have total, they don't feel pain. So techniques you would normally use to, compl to com make somebody comply, they're not feeling. They may have superhuman strength or they may have an ability to go from compliant to extreme non-compliance in a heartbeat. Do you train officers to keep drug influenced uh, suspects handcuffed? I do. Why? So there's been many instances where handcuffs were removed from a drug influenced suspect and as soon as they were removed or some type of first aid measure started to be applied, the person is right back to fighting you and you're in a fight for your life. So I've trained and I've been trained that when you're dealing with drug influenced persons, they stay handcuffed until they're taken to a medical facility if that's what the case may be and they're putting soft restraints on a gurney so they can be treated. Can you describe the concept of situational awareness? Yes, you know, I kind of break it down that uh, a police, you know, most people's heads should be on a swivel. You know, if you're walking down a street and you hear somebody running up behind you, your mind process, your mind thoughts shouldn't be, well, I wonder if they're going to tackle me, if they're going to rob me. No, you head on a swivel, which means you're cognizant of your awareness, see things that may be a threat or hazard to you, plan for them. And especially as a police officer, a police officer in uniform stands for certain things. Unfortunately, criminals don't wear uniforms, so officers don't have the luxury of being able to look at somebody and automatically determining if they're gonna be a threat or a risk to them or not. Does uh, the concepts of situational awareness come into or factor into your analysis? It does. How so? So what other threats are present besides the person that we're dealing with? Are there environmental hazards? Is there traffic going by on the street? Are there onlookers? Are there more people starting to focus on your arrest versus just walking down the sidewalk? Um, the officer's exhaustion level. You know, what are other officers doing? Things of that nature. Is an officer entitled to rely on information he or she receives from dispatch in formulating whether they're going to use force? In justifying force, I would say no. In preparing to deal with the situation they're being sent to by dispatch, then I would say yes. Okay. How does, how does that differ? differ? So an officer has to take into account what they see on the scene. Dispatchers do the best jobs they can, but they're usually only getting information over the telephone. And the information may be inaccurate, may be false, may be exaggerated. So it's up to the officer on the street to determine what is the best course of action. Okay. Have you reviewed um, Officer Chauvin's uses of force in this particular case, taking into consideration your analysis, as well as some of the concepts we've talked about? I have. And um, let's talk about um, Mr. Chauvin's uses of force. Where would you say the first use of force that Mr. Chauvin in, engaged in occurred? Uh, when he joined Officer King in Lane trying to put Mr. Floyd in the back seat of the patrol car. 
And in your view of that uh, use of force, um, what is your perspective on that? Uh, that Mr. Floyd's level of resistance was, it was objectively reasonable for those officers to do the techniques that they were doing. I felt that that level of resistance exhibited by Mr. Floyd justified the officers in higher levels use of force that they chose not to select. And would that be a, if an officer chooses not to use a higher level of force, is that a, a, an element of de-escalation? Rephrase. How does an officer's decision to use less force factor into an analysis of de-escalation techniques? So, you know, an officer sees an incident, feels it has these justification to use these tools to deal with the incident, but just due to the personality or the personal makeup of the officer, they chose not to. They try to expire a lesser technique to see if it'll work, and then if it doesn't work, then they escalate. Okay. Now, um, you, you've watched, you testified you've watched the videos in this case? Yes. Does that include the body-worn cameras of the Minneapolis police officers involved? It did. Did it include various bystander videos? Yes. And surveillance videos from area stores? Yes. And from your perspective, just generally, what are some of the limitations of camera analysis? So a body camera shows what the camera is pointing at. Um, it doesn't see what an officer may see in their peripheral vision, doesn't show what an officer is actually feeling through their hands or sensing through their levels of awareness. Um, and in low light situations, a body cam shutter responds to lighting situations quicker than the human eye does. Overruled. I'm, your last statement? About the, the shutter release on the body cam is that it adjusts quicker to lighting situations than the human eye does. Now, um, so in terms of the initial uses of force, the officer's efforts uh, to get Mr. Floyd into the car, you felt that they were objectively reasonable? I did. Did the use of force then continue after uh, Mr. Floyd was restrained on the ground? I don't consider a prone control as a use of force. Right. Um, let's, let's back up just a second. The removal or um, Mr. Floyd's getting out of the vehicle, however that was, um, did it, did it, does that constitute a use of force? Um, the manhandling or the three officers taking Mr. Floyd out of the car and placing him on the ground, yes, that's a use of force. Was it justified or objectively reasonable in this particular case according to your opinion? Yes. So when they brought Mr. Floyd to the ground, are you saying you don't consider that to be a use of force? Uh, up to that point, it was still a use of force, yes. Okay. Once Mr. Floyd is on the ground, in your opinion, does there continue to be some level of resistance by Mr. Floyd? Yes. How would you describe that? Um, active resistance, he was still struggling, the struggling against the efforts of the officers. And I saw on one of the body cam videos that Mr. Floyd appeared to kick at Officer Lane. Is there a reason why officers would take a suspect, a res actively resisting suspect to the ground? Yes. Why? So officers are trained that anytime you get resistance from a suspect or you're dealing with a high risk suspect, it's safer for you, the officer, and for the suspect to put him on the ground in a prone position face down for a variety of reasons, some of which are it makes the suspect's mobility diminished. They can't get up and run as quick. It takes away some of the use of their hands so they can't grab you without turning their body, which would give an officer time to react. Um, it limits what they can do with their feet. They can still kick, but they don't have as much mobility or power that they would if they were standing. Now, in terms of uh, this particular case, you understand Mr. Floyd was handcuffed at this point. Yes. 
does the fact that Mr. Hand, Mr. Floyd was handcuffed somehow um, come into the analysis as to whether or not to put him into a prone position? No, any resistor, handcuffed or not, should go to the ground into a prone control position. And can you describe generally what you mean as a prone control position? So it's where the suspect either, in this case, handcuffed, handcuffs are behind the back, placed on their stomach and their chest, and officers are in a position to apply body weight to keep the suspect on the ground and to keep them further immobilized. Would it be common practice in that situation uh, to employ an MRT or hobble restraint? You could. What would be the factors to determine whether or not an officer um, would employ such a technique? So can the officers control the person's legs? Does the person need to have their legs controlled in the situation they did? And could Officer Lane be successful in trying to control the legs? So it was those part of the force option selections that they had to make. In terms of your familiar officers in this particular case, uh, considered the use of the MRT? Uh, they did. And they ultimately decided against it, correct? That's correct. How does that factor into, or the, the decision to not employ the MRT factor into the analysis? That it's one of those situations where they were justified in the maximum restraint and chose not to. So why they had that decision making, I'm not sure. Maybe, you know, Mr. Floyd had made comments about being claustrophobic. And I know in the teaching I've done with leg restraints, if you leg restrain somebody in training or on the street that is claustrophobic, it creates a reaction. How does the fact that um, EMS had been summoned factor into your analysis? That I think what I've read in the materials is that there was a fire station literally seconds, if not a minute to a minute and a half away. So if you have somebody that's under control and is need of medical attention and EMS who have the training and equipment to do a lot better job than police officers can do, um, that would be relevant to me that, okay, we call them, they're gonna be here instantaneously. Let's just kind of stabilize the situation and wait for the professionals to show up. Would a reasonable police officer, based on the reasonable police officer standard, is that a factor that uh, comes into the analysis, the, the EMS response time? Yes. What about a suspect um, keeping a, su a suspect in the prone position who is potentially drug impaired? Are there safety reasons to do that? Again, so as I discussed earlier, potential erratic behavior going from compliant to non-compliant, um, not feeling any pain, potentially having superhuman strength, and it's just safer for the officer and for the suspect to keep them in that prone control. Why would it be safer for the suspect to keep them in that prone control? Because if they were to get up and run, handcuffed, trip and fall, sustain facial injuries, other injuries on the ground, their mobility is reduced, their ability to move is reduced, and the ability to hurt themselves is reduced. What if, what if they became sick, for example? Prone control, instead of having somebody lay on their back where they could aspirate on vomit, prone control, their face is down, airway is clear. If they vomit, it's not gonna go down their trachea or down their throat. Now you, you've obviously, in addition to watching the cameras, you heard what Mr. Floyd was saying at that time, right? Yes. And um, how do officers take into account uh, an analysis of words versus conduct? So you hear what the suspect is saying. So if I want Mr. Floyd to get in the back of the car and he's saying, I will, I will, I will, but he's not, and I'm trying to force him in, he says, I will, I will, but he's not, then his actions are telling me he's not getting in the car regardless of what he's saying. What about um, as Mr. Floyd was going into the car and there was this 
act of aggression as you've defined it, and Mr. Floyd at that point was saying he couldn't breathe. But he continued to say that later. How did the, how did the words he was saying initially comply or, or comport with his actions in that instant? You know, I have advanced first aid. I certainly don't have medical degrees, but I was always trained and feel it's a reasonable assumption that if, if somebody's, I'm choking, I'm choking, when well, you're not choking because you can breathe. If somebody's saying they can't breathe, yet it appears to me they're taking full breaths and they're shouting, to me, the layperson, they can breathe. Is that common? a common misunderstanding within the policing community? I believe it is, yes. Objection, lack of foundation, mistake. Overall. So in terms of um, a reasonable police officer standard again, is a reasonable police officer who has used force in an instant, can they consider that in uh, prolonging a detention or a prone control of a suspect? So if the officer was justified in using the prone control and now the suspect is on the ground in a prone control, the maintaining of the prone control to me is not a use of force. Why is it not a use of force? Because it's a control technique. Without It, it doesn't hurt. Um, you've put the suspect in a position where it's safe for you, the officer, safe for them, the suspect, and you're using minimal effort to keep them on the ground. Now, you're familiar with the concept of positional asphyxia, correct? I am. Can you describe for the jury um, uh, what you train and have been trained that are the dangers of positional asphyxia? So the training I received is that a target person for positional asphyxia would be somebody who is very obese. And now you take that obese person and you handcuff them behind their back, really pulling their shoulders back, really constricting their rib cage. And if you put them face down on the ground, that would be the training model for somebody who could be prone to positional asphyxia. And when I was first in law enforcement and the training I initially did regarding leg restraints is that you used to hobble a person's ankles, tie the ankles to the handcuffs, and then put the person face down, and that created even more pressure on the person's sternum and rib cage and reduced their ability to breathe. So that technique was modified to address the positional asphyxia issues. You would agree that the Minneapolis Police Department trains officers to place people in a recovery position, correct? Yes. And you would agree that that was, is based out of concerns of positional, positional asphyxia, agreed? Yes. Now, are there situations where a reasonable police officer would not put a person in the prone position into the recovery position? Yes. Can you describe what those may be? So in this situation, there was space limitations. Mr. Floyd was butted up against the tire of the patrol car. Um, there was traffic still driving down the street. Um, there were crowd issues that took the attention of the officers. Um, Mr. Floyd was still somewhat resisting. So I think those were relatively valid reasons to keep him in the prone. Now, in terms in terms of um, your training, uh, again, as uh, that you have been trained and trained other officers uh, in the use of crowd control or crowd control issues, right? Yes. Um, how in law enforcement is a crowd defined? So a crowd is just like if you look at a football stadium. So it's a group of people gathered together for a common purpose. So a crowd, by definition, isn't unlawful. Um, and actually the law enforcement definition is two or more people constitute a crowd. So because it's not unlawful, it doesn't mean that it doesn't become a consideration for the officers. Okay. Um, can you explain in your analysis how you think the crowd or this group of people that had uh, gathered around and were watching uh, affected the officers in their use of force? So we kind of go back to the situa situational awareness issue is that, yes, the officers are dealing with Mr. Floyd, but there's also other factors for them to consider. 
in his case, the crowd started to grow in size, started to become more vocal. So now officers are always trained to deal with, right, so what threat is the biggest threat? Is it the suspect on the ground in front of me in handcuffs that we have relatively controlled? Or is it the unknown threat posed by the crowd that could go from verbal to trying to interfere with my arrest process in a matter of seconds? Did you factor that into um, your analysis of this case? I did. How did it, how, how so? I could see that Officer Chauvin's focus started to move from Mr. Floyd to the crowd. To one point, I think Officer Chauvin felt threatened enough that he withdrew his pepper spray canister and gave verbal commands to the crowd to stay back. So now he's dealing with the bigger threat. So um, just to kind of wrap up, could you summarize the final opinions that you have made in this case? I felt that Officer Chauvin's interactions with Mr. Floyd were following his training, following current practices in policing, and were objectively reasonable. Thank you. I have no further questions. Mr. Sure. Sure. We're going to take a quick bathroom break. Five minutes, please. You can step out if you wish.
Me too, you're still in here. Yes, sir. Mr. Slusher. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. So I'm understanding your testimony. Uh, you indicate as a fundamental proposition that the defendant's conduct of restraining Mr. Floyd in the prone position on the ground, handcuffed, was not a use of force. That's correct. And I believe according to your testimony, it's because in your opinion, um, that position is not likely to inflict pain. Is that correct? That is correct. Now, uh, if it did in fact inflict pain upon Mr. Floyd, would that change your opinion? Only if the positioning of the body or if the officers were manipulating Mr. Floyd's hands in a way that would create pain, then yes, I would say that would be a use of force. So my question is, if, if Mr. Floyd actually experienced pain, would that change your opinion? Would it be then a use of force if pain was actually inflicted upon Mr. Floyd? If the pain was inflicted through the prone control, then yes, I would say that was a use of force. And the prone control, as we're describing here, just so that we make sure that we're talking about the same terms, would be um, placing Mr. Floyd on his stomach, correct? Yes. Face down. Yes. Handcuffed. Yes. And uh, as applied here, on a hard surface, on the pavement, correct? Yes. Right. And so if... Uh, if we're talking about that as the as the prone, you're calling it a prone control. Yes. And I use it interchangeably with prone restraint. Would I you think accept that the term. Same. Okay. So I'll refer to it as a prone restraint. Uh, Mr. Floyd is face down, handcuffed behind the back. Correct. Yes. And uh, at some point, the defendant is on top of him. Is that right? I think he had his knee on him. I'm not sure if I would describe that as being on top of him. Uh, if I may uh, publish to the witness Exhibit 17. All right. And so uh, as, stated, as shown here in Exhibit 17, you're able to see the exhibit. Is that right? Yes. All right. And you see that the uh, defendant has his knee on top of Mr. Floyd, is that correct? I see his knee in the vicinity of the upper back and neck area. Is it on the top or the bottom of Mr. Floyd? It's on his back, top being top of the head or? You tell me, is it on the top, the bottom, the side? Where is his knee? I see his knee on the upper spine and neck area. Is the upper spine then on the top? Okay, we can, go, we can use top. Okay, you would agree with me then? Yes. Okay. And so the defendant is on top of Mr. Floyd? His knee is on top of his... And you can't see where his other knee is in this photograph, is that right? That's correct. Uh, but you have reviewed the body-worn camera footage, correct? I have. And you've looked at the other exhibits that have been submitted in this case, or no? Uh, most of them. Okay. And so you're aware that now what we're looking at here is the defendant's left knee on top of Mr. Floyd, correct? Yes. Are you aware at this point in time that the defendant's right knee is also on top of Mr. Floyd? I believe it was on his arm or to the side of his body. You believe it was on his arm? Yes. Okay. On, on top of him though, right? Yes. Okay. And so... To answer my question, the defendant is on top of Mr. Floyd on Exhibit 17. Is that right? Again, when I say on top, I think he's laying his complete body on top of Mr. Floyd. What I see is, is the knee positions. Okay. Both knees on top of Mr. Floyd? Yes. Okay. And, uh, and also, are, are you aware that uh, the defendant weighed approximately 140 pounds at the time this took place? Were you aware of that by your review of the records? Yes. And uh, in your experience, does the clothing and equipment uh, that the defendant is wearing in, his, in Exhibit 17, could that add some amount of weight uh, to the defendant? Yes. And that would then 
increase the amount of pressure or force being placed on Mr. Floyd at this time. Is that right? It could. Okay. And so looking then at Exhibit 17 and just starting with the fundamental uh, premise of your testimony that what we're seeing here is not a use of force, I need to ask you if you believe that it is unlikely that orienting yourself on top of a person on the pavement with both legs is unlikely to produce pain? It could. What do you mean it could? Is it unlikely to produce pain or is it likely to produce pain? I'm saying it could produce pain. It could? Yes. Uh, and if it could produce pain then, again just looking at your premise, if it could produce pain then it would be a use of force, wouldn't it? If the officer's intent was to inflict pain, that Not would be use of force? Not the officer's intent, sir. What you said is that it was unlikely to produce pain, and that's why it wasn't a use of force. You now just said that it could produce pain. And so, regardless of the officer's intent, if this act that we're looking at here in Exhibit 17 could produce pain, would you agree that what we're seeing here is a use of force? Shown in this picture, that could be a use of force. Okay. If you'd take that down, please. Um, and, and sir, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, uh, positional asphyxia, if I'm to understand your testimony about positional asphyxia. This is something that you're familiar with, is that right? Yes. Uh, this is something that you've uh, taught in courses to uh, uh, budding officers, I'm assuming, the dangers of positional asphyxia? Yes. Okay. And in positional asphyxia, is it true that, that positional asphyxia is a result of some oxygen deprivation? Is that right? Yes. And that is as a result of uh, a, a chest cavity, the inability for the lungs to expand. Fair? Yes. And the in positional asphyxia, as understood in law enforcement, can be a result of being uh, having your chest, your body weight, on the ground, right, in the prone position. Your own body weight, the subject's own body weight. That could, yes. Like, that could cause positional asphyxia, just the body weight itself. If the person is extremely obese. Sure. If you or I were to lie with our hands cuffed behind our back on the ground, I don't think either one of us would be prone to positional asphyxia. Well, I will take that as a compliment, just for the purposes <laughs> of argument here. Um, but, uh, but there can be instances, certainly, in which a person, by nature of their own body weight, could experience positional asphyxia. True? It's possible. Okay. And uh, things that could you know, further exacerbate or contribute to that could be uh, the use of restraint, correct? The handcuffs behind the back. Yes. And additional pressure as well. So um, you being a, a, a non-obese fit person, right? If someone was pressing down on you, that would sort of take the place of excess body weight and that could contribute to positional asphyxia. True? It's possible. And, and if uh, the pressure, obviously, the greater the pressure being exerted, the more uh, of a potential danger of positional asphyxia. Fair? Yes. And uh, the dangers of uh, positional asphyxia due to being restrained in the prone position is, is a known risk, is that right? Yes. Uh, and it's something you know about, true? Yes. It's something you teach in your courses, correct, in training? Yes. And this is something, you've been in law enforcement, did you say since 1972? Uh, for 79 years, excuse me, 29 years. Okay, 29 years. Um, at what point uh, did you become aware of the dangers associated with positional asphyxia? Probably late 80s. So 
looking over 30 years that you've been aware of the dangers of positional asphyxia, right? Yes. And would you agree that that's something that's commonly understood in law enforcement, that, that, that this is a known risk? Yes. So this is not new information? No. And there are ways to uh, mitigate against the risks of positional asphyxia that are known to law enforcement, is that right? Yes. And I think what you testified to is uh, the side recovery position. Can you describe the side recovery position? So when a suspect is handcuffed, you just pull them to their side and have them tuck their knees up? It, kind of like a fetal position almost? Like a fetal position. Right. And so um, you're, you've also been a defensive tactics instructor, correct? Yes. And, uh, and you've been certified as such, right? Yes. Are you uh, aware of how one might put somebody in the side recovery position? It's fairly simple to do, just pull them to their side. Okay. Does it take a long time? No. So it's simple, it's fairly quick, and in your opinion, it alleviates or could alleviate against the, the dangers of positional asphyxia. True? Yes. Now, I know that you uh, reviewed various uh, MPD policies in uh, connection with your review of this case. Is that right? Yes. And getting back to uh, the issue of whether what we saw in Exhibit 17 at that particular time was a use of force, are you aware of how uh, the Minneapolis Police Department defines force? Not specifically, no. I would have a general understanding of it. Generally, would you agree, or based on your review, would you accept that the Minneapolis Police Department generally defines force to include restraint? It can. Uh, particularly if it's restraint that could result in some sort of injury or pain. Yes. Fair? Okay. And so you would agree then, just as we are at this point in your testimony that you know, what we saw in Exhibit 17 would at least fit within the Minneapolis Police Department policy of a use of force. Fair? Yes. And a reasonable police officer would adhere to the policies of their own department. True? Yes. In your uh, analysis of how, you know, under the gram factors, how you're going to go about a force review, you indicated that one of the things that you look at is the severity of the crime. True? Yes. And uh, severity of the crime is something that, would you agree uh, the label of the crime, whether it's a misdemeanor or a gross misdemeanor in Minnesota or a felony, isn't as important as the underlying conduct involved in the crime? I agree. And so a felony level uh, bad check uh, may, from a use of force standpoint, be less serious than a misdemeanor domestic assault. Fair? So by the nature of the terminology of the crime, I agree. But obviously a domestic violence case is a serious and a potentially violent environment. And, and really, maybe that was an inartful question, but that's what I'm asking. In this case, the misdemeanor, what's labeled as a misdemeanor, assault would, from a use of force perspective, be more serious than, say, writing a bad check but at a felony level. That could, yes. And you're aware that in this case, the uh, initial call that the officers were responding to was a, a counterfeiting allegation or forgery allegation passing a fake $20 bill, right? Yes. And could you agree that uh, in terms of you know the range of criminal offenses this would be at a fairly low level from a use of force perspective yes but again as i mentioned earlier well what i was asking is if you could agree 
and I'll give you a chance to explain if you want, but you, you would agree that in terms of the range of different criminal offenses that are available, a counterfeiting call over an alleged fake $20 bill is on the less serious side. Yes. And, and I think what you probably were about to say is that, but that could change, right? And again, it's all about the contact and the resistance of the suspect. Right. Which is completely different than the seriousness of the underlying offense. That's why I stopped you. I didn't want to be rude, but let's just keep this in the, that analytical framework for now. Seriousness of the offense, um, not the response, because we'll get to that, the response of the subject. Okay. And, and would, it, would you say, uh, would you agree with me that you know, the, the response of the subject, the activities of the subject to the officer on the scene, that's probably the operative uh, important facts here, right? That's what you need to look at. Yes. So in terms of the seriousness of the, of the crime, that's not as important. Let's take a look at the imminence of the threat. You discussed imminence of the threat. Officers have to assess that, is that right? Yes. And could you please, for the jury, explain in your words what you mean by threat? What is a threat? You look at a person and you can't see their hands. They have their hands in their pocket. That could be a threat that in their pocket is a gun. You look at a person and the way they position their body, angle their body back into maybe a confrontational stance, that could be a threat. All right, so right now I have my hands, both my hands in my pocket. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be confrontational. I don't know if I look confrontational, but uh, am I a threat? Um, if I was walking up to you on the street and it's going to be reasonable suspicion that you have committed some type of criminal activity, I would, from a position of cover, ideally, tell you to take your hands out of your pockets. Would you agree that there's a difference between a threat and a risk? Yes. And so, really, any person can present a, a risk, right? Yes. Uh, someone could have their hands in their pocket and unexpectedly uh, have a weapon. True? Yes. Uh, or not. Or not. Okay. That's a risk. But would you agree that a threat is when I would be doing something to show some sort of intention to cause you harm? Balling up my fists, approaching you in an aggressive manner. That would be a, a, a threat, correct? Some type of cues, yes. And would you agree that officers are authorized to use force to respond to a threat? Yes. Officers are not authorized to use force to respond to a mere risk, fair? Correct. So there are many different factors that could be a risk versus a threat. Someone uh, who's a large in stature, okay. that could be a risk, true? Could. Uh, but that's not in and of itself a threat, is it? No. You can't use force on someone just because they're large. True? That's correct. The use of drugs or intoxicants, um, that could be a risk factor. True? Yes. And, and, and on that subject, you know, with respect to uh, what a reasonable officer understands about the use of drugs and, and alcohol, controlled substances, there's a whole range of drugs out there, right? Yes. And there's a whole range of uh, drug users out there, correct? Yes. And uh, there are some drugs that could cause someone to become aggressive, true? Yes. And there's some drugs that can cause uh, the user to become somewhat sedate, true? Yes. And uh, so just hearing that someone is, you know, quote, on something, that is not necessarily a threat to the officer, correct? Unless there's behavior that makes the officer believe that the person's drug influenced. Agreed. If there's behavior. Behavior that they're drug influenced or behavior that they're going to be doing something threatening to the officer? Because the there's officer a difference, right? Sorry, I missed something. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's a difference between someone, uh, someone manifesting behavior that they may be using drugs or manifesting a behavior that they're going to threaten you, right? Again, but the manifestation of the drug influence could pose a threat. Okay. But, I mean, one manifestation of drug influence is that somebody's passed out, right? 
Yes. That probably does not constitute a threat to you, does it? No. Um, that's more of a vulnerability of the person who's using the controlled substance, right? Yes. So if someone is, quote, on something in and of itself, that is not a justification to use force, true? True. And if the person who is on something is of large size, those two things combine, those two risks together combine, those don't justify the use of force, do they? No, there need to be a third component that is the actions of the suspect. Right, the, the behavior of the subject, what they did. Fair? Yes. It also, just in terms of the, the decision of an officer to use force, uh, that is driven by the behavior of the subject, correct? Yes. The uh, decision to use force on a subject is not dependent upon what some third party over whom the subject has no control and is not directing is doing, correct? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Let's say that you're distracted by something Mr. Nelson is doing. Let's say maybe he's even threatening you. That's not a justification for you to use force against me, is it? No. Because I certainly have no control over Mr. Nelson, right? Correct. All right. And so if there are, for example, in the, in the instance of a, of a bystander, if a bystander is doing something that an officer finds threatening or irritating or distracting or annoying, those activities don't justify a use of force against someone who is not directing those activities. Fair? Yes. All right. It might explain the officer's state of mind in a particular moment, but it's not a justification for the use of force. True? I agree. Okay. You talked about uh, situational awareness, and situational awareness is something that is important for, I think your testimony was anyone, and we can agree with that, right? Yes. Um, but in particular, situational awareness is something important for an officer, a reasonable officer to have, correct? Yes. And that situational awareness has to include really under, under Graham, all the facts and circumstances, the totality of facts and circumstances that are presented to the officer at the time, true? Yes. And, and in looking particularly at the behavior of the person upon whom force is being applied, it's important that the officer is situationally aware of the condition of the subject, correct? Yes. Because if the subject does something uh, aggressive, they may need to adjust their uh, plan and the use of force, correct? Their application. Yes. But if the subject is manifesting compliance or a medical condition, illness, the officer needs to be situationally aware of that as well. Fair? Should. Do you agree, and having read the training materials and you're aware of MPD policy, and, and uh, uh, I'm assuming you've listened to some of the testimony in this case, as an expert, you're allowed to do that? Uh, I listened to two testimonies from the use force expert. All right. Do you agree with the proposition that in law enforcement, once somebody is in your custody, they're in your care. I agree. And, and in fact, that's the MPD policy and training, in your custody, in your care, correct? Yes. And situational awareness then, would you agree, sir, that includes being aware of the subject's medical condition? Yes. Particularly if they're exhibiting signs of distress? Yes. Loss of consciousness? Yes. Inability to breathe? Yes. Loss of pulse? Yes. All of these things uh, a reasonable officer should take into consideration when determining whether to escalate force, de-escalate force, or remain the same, correct? Yes. Now, would you agree, sir, that the application of use of force must be reasonable at the start and at the end? True? I agree. And at all points in between? Yes. And if there's ever a point at which the use of force becomes unreasonable, right, 
that that it must stop or de-escalate or de-escalate um, it must de-escalate to a point of being reasonable correct yes because that's really the standard uh, is that of reasonability right yes yeah and and uh, you know, in terms of proportionality, you've read the materials, you've studied the uh, MPD policies, you're familiar with the uh, MPD Defense Tactics and Control Guide the continuum, Use Force Continuum? Yes. Okay. And you uh, would agree that that continuum, which we've all seen, is a tool that an officer can use to, you know, make some kind of a rough uh, approximation of what is proportional, a proportional response. Right? Yes. You would agree, based on your review of Minneapolis Police Department policy, that the, the sanctity of life and protection of the public, those are the cornerstones of Minneapolis Police Department's use of force policy. True? Yes. In your review of the Minneapolis Police Department manual, the use of force manual, you received a copy of the manual, I'm assuming? Uh, use of force 5-300? That's correct, 5-300. Yes. In that, in your study of uh, Minneapolis use of force policy 5-300 series, did you see the phrase or term one-upsmanship anywhere in this policy? No. So you would agree that one-upsmanship is not the cornerstone of Minneapolis Police Department's use of force policy. It's protection of the public and the sanctity of life. True? And I use the phrase one-upmanship to describe how the standards of police training throughout the country are. You're using one-upmanship to describe the concept of proportionality. True? Yes. And one-upmanship is, uh, I guess if that's an accurate description of what you're trying to uh, express as far as uh, proportionality, wouldn't that suggest, I mean, what, what is the limit to the one-upmanship that an officer can do? Uh, as I described earlier, that if a person tries to strike you or kick you, that the officer doesn't have to respond with their own punches or kicks. They can respond with a better tool, which would be an impact weapon or a taser or pepper spray. If the suspect were to grab hold of the officer's baton or taser, then the officer may find themselves in imminent threat and respond with potential deadly force. I, and, and I think the examples you used were strike you, stab you, shoot you, um, were some examples that you were talking about in terms of one-upsmanship, but that's, that wasn't the answer I was looking for. In terms of one-upsmanship, isn't what the officer is always limited uh, in their response by the uh, Graham versus Connor standards of reasonableness, right? True. And so whatever step the officer takes to either escalate or de-escalate, it must be objectively reasonable, correct? I agree. And that's why someone who is not resisting, who is uh, being compliant, that's why that person uh, cannot uh, have any force at all exerted against them. Is that right? I don't agree with that. If a person is not resisting and is not non-compliant, so let me phrase it better, compliant, that doesn't they're not uh, officers not justified in using force if they're being complied with so True. they'd be using control if the suspects in their custody right. and control in under your definition like if we're if we're looking just at pure control that is a restraint that's not likely to inflict pain correct yes that's control but, but you've agreed that exhibit 17 what we saw here in this case was likely to produce pain True. It could. And so if someone is not resisting and they're compliant, the use of something, a uh, uh, control as you put it, that could produce pain is just not justified, is it? No. And we talked about the use of force needing to be uh, appropriate from reasonable from the beginning to the end and at all points in between. Is that right? Yes. And the officer must reassess the situation, must reevaluate the situation, must be taking in information. Is that right? Yes. And that can include information from 
uh, the, the suspect, the person upon whom they're using control, correct? Yes. That could be information that they're getting from other sources. For example, fellow officers, true? Yes. If a fellow officer makes some comment or assessment as to the condition of the subject, a reasonable officer takes that into account. Is that right? Should. And that information we use to factor in, to reassess the situation, to determine whether or not force should be escalated, de-escalated, or discontinued. Fair? Yes. And you would agree, you know, we were talking about the, um, the, the threat assessment, you're talking about stabbing, striking, shooting. You agree that based upon your review of the evidence in this case, there was no stabbing attempt by Mr. Floyd, correct? Correct. He wasn't trying to shoot anyone, correct? Yes. All right. And uh, we should talk about the specific circumstances uh, here of what happened on May 25, 2020. Would you agree uh, as a general premise that Mr. Floyd was handcuffed, restrained in the prone position for approximately nine minutes and 29 seconds? Yes. And during uh, that nine minutes and 29 seconds, uh, did you note any significant difference in the manner in which Mr. Floyd was restrained? No. Did you note any differences in the manner in which uh, Mr. Floyd was acting during that entire restraint period from the first point to the 929? Did you notice any differences with him? Yes. Okay. For example, uh, when he first was placed prone on the ground, he was speaking, correct? And actively resisting, yes. And actively resisting when he was prone? Yes. How long did that uh, take place? I'm not sure. I'd say a couple minutes. A couple minutes that he was actively resisting? Yes, struggling against the officers. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, talk about the point when Mr. When Mr. Floyd, when the restraint of Mr. Floyd first began, and I'd like to show you a clip. Uh, from Exhibit 127, which is a composite of the King body-worn camera and the Frazier video. Uh, and that's uh, going to be starting at 2019-09, which can we agree is the beginning, around the beginning of the restraint period, based on your review? I, I was looking for a screen, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed that question. All right. Uh, the King body worn camera. Okay. Uh, right around the time of 2019-09, would you agree that this is right around the beginning of the restraint period? I'll have to go with your approximation on the time. And and when we when we pull up the clip, why don't you pull up the clip and we publish it and hit pause right away? All right. So you can see the. Um, the notation on the top of the screen at 2019-09? Yes. Okay. Would you agree that that's the, uh, the beginning of the restraint period, is towards the beginning of the restraint period? Okay. You agree? I'm not sure, but I'll take your word for it. All right, well, why don't we just watch it? Uh, and this is gonna go through 2019-16. On the ground. Ah, my and so right around uh, 2019 right when it's first when we first saw the clip mr. Floyd was standing or kneeling by the squad car true yes and did you hear what mr. Floyd said when he was kneeling at the squad car uh, thank you or something to those lines now, I, I want to back you up a little bit just in terms of situational awareness, and you're aware that uh, the defendant received um, uh, many hours of paid training by the Minneapolis Police Department, correct? Yes. Right around 889 hours, correct? Sounds about right. Are you familiar with crisis intervention training and what that is? Yes. You're aware that the defendant took a 40-hour course in crisis intervention training? Yes. And that generally is uh, education to make people aware of 
different Im impediments to compliance, such as uh, mental illness or uh, intoxication. True. Yes. Anxiety would fit in there, correct? Could. Perhaps claustrophobia. Could. Right. And when uh, Officer uh, Chauvin, the defendant, first approached the vehicle, and this was before uh, Mr. Floyd uh, went in right in the back, uh, when he first got on the scene, uh, through Officer Chauvin's body-worn camera, you could hear Mr. Floyd saying that he had anxiety and claustrophobia, correct? Yes. And then there was a struggle, and you observed the struggle uh, in, in the back of the car when the officers forced Mr. Floyd in the back of the car, right? Yes. And then when he came out, uh, he was kneeling right around the time we were looking. He was on his knees. He's handcuffed, right? Yes. Uh, and he says, thank you, right? Yes. And it was after that point that Mr. Floyd was then uh, pushed over by the officers onto the ground, correct? Yes. And at the time he was pushed onto the ground, uh, just taking note of his body position, was he, when he was initially pushed onto the ground, would that have qualified as a sort of a side recovery position? Uh, we'd have to back it up, and I'm not, I'm not sure how long he was in that Please position. Do. And so when he was, in, were you able to see that? I was. All right, so when, when Mr. Floyd was initially brought from his you know, handcuff position on his knees to the ground, right, he was in effectively a side recovery position, fair? Momentarily, yes. Okay. And then he was taken out of the side recovery position by the officers and then after that point placed in the prone position. True? Yes. And so right after uh, this clip runs, we see Mr. Floyd in uh, the prone position, correct? Yes. Face down on the ground, handcuffed, true? Yes. And the defendant and uh, Officer King and Officer Lane then thereafter all took part in restraining Mr. Floyd in the prone position on the ground, based on your review, correct? Yes. And uh, you were able to see then uh, from Exhibit 17 that uh, the defendant had one knee at least on Mr. Floyd's body, on his neck, in the neck back area, correct? Yes. Okay, on top. And you could see that uh, he had his other knee also, I believe you said near his arm, but it was on his back, correct? I really couldn't tell from that picture. I took that from the snapshots of the body board cameras. Um, and so when you say that, you're agreeing that the defendant was on Mr. Floyd's neck and back, at least at some portions of the restraint, fair? I would say upper back in the proximity of the neck, and then his right knee was towards the, more of his rib cage. Mm -hmm. On top of him though, correct? Yes. Adding to the pressure, fair? Could. Uh, sir, I'd like to show you, uh, just for a little more clarification, Exhibit 240, which has been received into evidence, and this might provide a, a better view. Okay, and so you testified just a moment ago that you thought that the defendant's knee was, was where? Upper back and neck. Okay. And so would you agree I'm placing a circle, would that be... Mr. Floyd's back, upper back? That would be his upper back. Okay. And I'll just place a, another circle. Uh, that's the defendant's knee. It is. His left knee. That's above the area that you've identified as Mr. Floyd's upper back, isn't it? Yes. Uh, his left knee is on Mr. Floyd's neck in this picture, in Exhibit 240, isn't it? In this picture, yes. Okay. Now I'd like to talk about his right knee. And you can see Mr. Floyd's arm, where I'm drawing, correct? Yes. And you can see the handcuffs, correct? Yes. Okay. And this is the defendant's right knee, correct? Yes. 
Would you agree that the defendant's right knee is on the defendant is on uh, Mr. Floyd's lower back? Uh, looks like it's on his shoulder blade area to me. Okay, so the shoulder blade area would be that. Would you clear that, Your Honor? I seem to have trouble here. I appreciate that. So the shoulder blade area, then, I guess that would be um, Mr. Floyd's upper back. Yes. Okay. So you would agree, based on Exhibit 240, that the defendant's on his his left knee is on Mr. Floyd's neck, his right knee is on Mr. Floyd's back. Correct. Yes. And I believe uh, your testimony early was, earlier was that you've watched the entirety of this body-worn camera videos, true? Yes. And, and you would agree with me that there's a wealth of body-worn camera video footage in this case, true? Yes. And milestone video and surveillance video and bystander video, correct? Yes. So you're able to view, uh, as an expert, you know, the conduct here from multiple angles, true? Yes. And, and so with that sort of, uh, uh, I guess, redundancy built into the record, does that alleviate some of the concerns or considerations I think you were testifying to on your direct examination regarding um, how cameras react to light? Yes. Okay. So this exhibit, 240, is actually an image taken, uh, you can see it's at 2019-27, that's about 13 seconds after uh, the defendant placed Mr. Floyd in this prone position. You agree? Uh, he was one of the three that put him in the prone. Sure. After, and, and, uh, and so we'll say, after the defendant and the two other officers put Mr. Floyd in the in the prone position restrained on the ground, correct? Yes. All right, and then uh, the first video that we play would demonstrate then that this restraint that we're talking about, which you said it was a, it was a, was a controlled restraint, or what was the term you used? Prone control. Prone control. That began around 2019-14. Fair? Okay. Okay. And, uh, I believe you testified that from the beginning to the end, you did not see the defendant's relative position on Mr. Floyd's body meaningfully change. Did you? Um, can you rephrase the question? Did the defendant get up from the point in which the prone restraint began and the prone restraint ended? Did he get up? Did he get up? No. Okay. Did he let up off of him any any pressure it appears that his body position changed and he was putting more weight over his calves as the restraint continued and are you able to identify based on your own review because I know you've looked at this correct yes and, and I'm assuming you've looked at it a lot in preparation for testimony today correct yes are you able to point to any particular portion of the video record in which you say that the defendant shifted his weight more towards his calves to take pressure off? I would have to see the 14 body camera snapshots and then we can focus on those. Now, sir, I'm going to show you another portion of the um, uh, body-worn camera video, and that's going to be at, uh, it's been received as uh, Exhibit 127. It's a composite of uh, King's body-worn camera and the Frazier video. And we're going to start at 20, 23, 11. Should be exhibit 127, it should be composite of King and the Frazier video. And 
we should be starting at yeah 2023. This starts at 20, 2310. Right, if you'd play this uh, portion, please. And then, uh, just having reviewed that video, I'd like to show you uh, what's uh, been marked as demonstrative exhibit 947. 947. So in demonstrative exhibit 947, you see it's a still frame captured from uh, uh, composite, I guess, or the exhibit 15, which has been received into evidence at uh, the time, it's non-military time, but it's 8.23.14. And this is uh, roughly corresponding with the clip I just showed you. Can you show, uh, do you see uh, the defendant's, the foot on his uh, left, left leg? Yes. Okay. And do you see how it's uh, slightly off the ground? Yes. Right. Now, you would agree that, uh, you know, given the orientation of the defendant's foot at this particular moment in time, uh, there would be more pressure placed on Mr. Floyd's neck and back. True? It's possible. It's more than possible, isn't it? I mean, his So the reason why I say possible is that Mr. Floyd's movements could have, in that moment, taken Mr. Chauvin's foot off the ground. Let's take a look at that clip we just watched again, please. Oh. 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 Restraint. Oh. Oh. Are those the movements you're talking about that could have moved his foot up? Yes, and I saw the officer reach out for a low balance by supporting his left hand up against the back of the squad car. And, and the balance issue is important because you know when you place your yourself the, both knees on a on a person, that's not a very good balance point, is it? Mm, it depends. Well, apparently it wasn't here if the defendant was trying to balance himself against the car, correct? Or he's just responding to Mr. Floyd's movements. Mm. But as you saw in the portion uh, that you looked at, uh, the defendant's body weight was not being supported by his foot because his foot was off the ground, correct? At that moment that that picture was taken, yes. And that would increase the pressure on Mr. Floyd. Whether like I said earlier, it could be in response to his movement. Whether it's in response to his movement or not, the question is, would it increase the pressure? Would it increase the pressure? I don't know. Um, we've discussed a little bit about uh, the defendant's initial abuse of force to restrain Mr. Floyd. Right? And I, I'd like to discuss now what happens next. As you've analyzed all of these videos, but it's important that we get the full scope of your, your opinion here. So we're going to go back to Exhibit 127 and begin at clip uh, 201923. And if you can start playing now. Okay. Okay. Grab that. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Thank you. Okay, breathe. Stop moving. Thank you. So during that segment, that was about nine seconds, the beginning of it was about nine seconds after Mr. Floyd was placed in the prone position. Would you agree? Yes. And during that period of time, 
you heard Mr. Floyd say uh, multiple times, I can't breathe. True? Yes. Uh, did you count how many times? No. I counted six. Would you have any reason to dispute that? No. And uh, obviously the defendant would know, a reasonable officer would know, that this prone position could present a danger of positional asphyxia. True? It's potential. And, uh, and that it's important then, uh, in terms of situational awareness, to not only be aware of that training and prior knowledge, but to pay attention to what the subject is saying, correct? Yes. And the subject here is saying multiple times, I can't breathe, correct? That's correct. Now, I think your testimony earlier is that there can be times in which people can say they, they don't breathe and don't mean it, right? Yes. Um, might be faking it, I guess, right? Good. But uh, context is really everything, isn't it? Can be. Because part of the reasonable police officer analysis assumes that you have a reasonable person applying the standards and using a little bit of their common sense. Fair? Yes. All right. And so uh, if I have, uh, uh, I'm standing here talking to you normally in a normal tone, in a normal voice, and I tell you, I can't breathe. You, I'm standing here, I'm talking to you. You might have uh, reason to doubt me, correct? Yes. But in a situation where we have here, where you're actually physically on top of someone, in a, in a position which, based on your training, and based on your experience, and based on your knowledge, could cause positional asphyxia, that's a different context, correct? Yes. And in that context, it, it would, a reasonable police officer would at least acknowledge and consider the possibility that what they're doing is causing a problem, wouldn't they? Where you would interpret what Mr. Floyd is doing while he's making the statements, and it appeared to me with that video that he was still struggling. Struggling or writhing? I don't know the difference. Well, would a reasonable police officer on the scene consider whether somebody is actively resisting or writhing on the ground because they can't breathe? I think it'd be reasonable for the officer to take what Mr. Floyd had been doing prior to that and still consider that he was struggling. And, and prior to that, uh, you would acknowledge that there was a, a physical struggle, correct? Yes. Physical struggles can be exhausting, correct? They can. That's uh, exhaustion is based on your training and your knowledge and your experience, another potential risk factor associated with positional asphyxia, true? Can be, yes. It can complicate things, true? Yes. As can intoxication, true? Alcohol or drug? Let's start with alcohol. I don't know. Okay. Um, drug intoxication could also be a risk factor with positional asphyxia, true? It can. And when we talk about some of the different factors and things that we've known at the scene, a reasonable police officer in the defendant's position would have taken those factors into account as well, true? Yes. From his vantage point on top of Mr. Floyd, fair? Yes. We take our technology break at this point, Judge? Yeah. All right. Take our 20 minute break. Come back at 320.
All right, still on roll. Okay, Mr. Slisher, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. And, and sir, I'm going to ask you some questions uh, just to see if we can uh, skip through some of the video uh, as well. You would acknowledge, you testified about uh, uh, the bystanders uh, who had gathered by, is that right? Yes. And I think you defined a, a crowd in the, in the law enforcement parlance as more than two people? Gathered for a common purpose. I always heard three is a crowd, but it's two people or two people or more. I guess that'd be three. Uh, so that would constitute a crowd. Not all crowds are, of course, uh, threatening. Is that right? Correct. Uh, or even distracting. Correct. Not all crowds. No. And in fact, uh, let's talk about the specific bystanders here. You would uh, agree that at the time that the restraint period began, uh, there really were no bystanders. Right? There are no bystanders there. True. Uh, I think there was one gentleman that was there pretty much the whole time. Are you talking about Charles McMillan? I'm not sure what his name was. 61-year-old. Well, let, let's take a look at Exhibit uh, 49 at uh, it's a Officer Tao's body-worn camera at 2019-23. You would publish that, please. Ah. 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 I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Ah, stop moving. Uh, and at that time, then you see there, the camera had panned out into the street, and there was the one gentleman that you'd referred to, correct? Yes. And uh, did he appear to be saying anything? Not that I heard, no. Doing anything? No. Threatening? Didn't appear to be, no. Major risk factor? No. And, and during that period of time, you heard Mr. Floyd uh, repeating that he can't breathe, correct? Yes. And so uh, a reasonable officer in the defendant's position at that time shouldn't have been at least distracted by Mr. McMillan. Fair? Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Now, if we could go to uh, a little bit forward, Take a look at Exhibit 127, starting at 2021-28. Uh, and we'll play that through 2021-59. Uh, uh, please, please, please. I can't breathe. You're doing fine. You're talking oh, you're fine. Yeah, I can't breathe. Let breathe leave, man. I can't breathe. I've been I can't breathe. Ah, so ah, 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 my body's just dying to sleep. Relax. Man, I can't breathe my face. Just get up. What do you want? I can't breathe. Please, just leave my dick. I can't breathe shit. Get up. All right, and so, sir, at this point, the clip that we just heard, uh, the restraint is continued, fair? Yes. Great. And, and this, then, uh, as he's talking, you can hear Mr. Floyd at least expressing that he's in some kind of distress. Fair? Yes. Indicating that he can't breathe. That's what he's saying. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, the defendant is on top of him. True? Yes. And so in the context here, that might be a reasonable police officer might tend to believe him, correct? I'm sorry, believe? Mr. Floyd. That he he's can't saying breathe. he can't breathe, and the defendant is uh, on top of him on the hard pavement, in that context, a reasonable police officer might tend to lend that some more credibility than, say, if he was shouting it from across the street at normal tones. It's possible. Okay. And uh, at this point, did you uh, see anyone, uh, any bystanders in the crowd? Uh, the clip really wasn't showing much. I did see two people look like Officer Tao engage with one person, tell them to get back on the sidewalk. Well, let's take a look uh, at around the same time, which is uh, Tao's body-worn camera, which is marked as Exhibit uh, 49 at 2021-18. we be about 10 seconds earlier than the clip I just showed you. If we could play that, please. Please, Liz, my young man. Relax. I can't breathe. You're doing fine. You're talking fine. I can't breathe. 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 I can't breathe
Ah, so he's afraid. I'm about to just die in your face. Ah. Relax. Man, I can't breathe my face. Just get up. Ah. Ah. What, do you, what do you want? I can't breathe. Please, the knee in my dick. I can't breathe shit. Ah. Well, get up, get in the car. Ah. All right, and so uh, where we ended, we just heard that would have been the 61-year-old Charles McMillan saying something to the effect of get up and get in the car, right? Okay, I heard that. All right, and then you saw some other bystanders, correct? Yes. And those bystanders appeared to be um, a ways away from Officer Tao, correct? On the sidewalk, yes. On the sidewalk, and they were uh, a couple of uh, teenage girls, correct? I saw one woman, I thought I saw a man, and they're both recording. Recording, uh, there was a, someone in a hooded shirt with a phone, correct? Yes. All right, and then there was someone who was in a white t-shirt with a phone? Yes. Okay. And uh, did they appear to be saying anything? No. And so it would be fair to say that uh, people on the sidewalk at that point wouldn't have been doing anything that could have been distracting a reasonable police officer at the scene, correct? At that point, yes. All right, and then uh, I'd just like to show you, it's been marked, it's exhibit uh, 127 at 2022-22 through 2022-36 further in the restraint. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Everything hurts. Ah, there's water or something. Please. Please. Ah All right, and so that clip started about 23 seconds after the last clip I just played you. You were able to hear that? Yes. All right, and you heard Mr. Floyd saying that he couldn't breathe, correct? Yes. You heard Mr. Floyd saying that his stomach hurt, is that right? I wasn't listening for that. I heard him ask for water, I think. You heard him ask for water? Yes. Would you believe me if I told you that what Mr. Floyd said was my stomach hurts, my neck hurts, everything hurts? I heard everything hurts, yes. Okay. And, and that would be uh, you know, some sort of expression of pain, fair? You could. Okay. And uh, a reasonable police officer in the defendant's position would have heard that, correct? I believe so. From his position on top of Mr. Floyd. True? It's possible. And the bystanders who were there, uh, again, you couldn't hear any noise interference or anything like that, true? Not then, no. All right, and so would it be fair to say that there was nothing that the bystanders were doing at that moment in time that we just watched that would have been distracting or preventing the defendant from attending to Mr. Floyd? Not during that video clip, no. Okay. And I'm sorry, did you or did you not hear Mr. Floyd say that his neck hurts in that clip? I didn't hear that. Did you note that at all in your analysis of this case? At any time, when you listen to the body-worn camera, when you listen to uh, the bystander video, when you reviewed the facts and evidence in this case, at any time do you recall noting Mr. Floyd saying, my neck hurts? I heard it. I didn't necessarily note it. Okay. Because your, your testimony was premised on this not being a use of force because there was no pain involved, right? Yes. But you didn't note that? No. Fact? In response to um, uh, Mr. Floyd's uh, complaints for pain, uh, you heard a, a voice. Did you recognize that voice responding to Mr. Floyd? In this last video clip? Yes. I didn't, no. Did you hear an officer say, uh-huh? I heard somebody say that. And based upon your review, you've reviewed all of this, correct? Yes. You've reviewed uh, footage in which uh, the defendant can be seen and uh, can be heard speaking, correct? Yes. Right. Were you able to make out the person who said, uh-huh, as the voice of the defendant? 
So when I looked at this video clip, I thought we're still looking at the, focusing on the bystanders, so I wasn't really listening to what the communications were. I mean in your own analysis prior to coming to court today, and I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but in, in your own analysis before coming to court today, had you identified that voice that said, uh-huh, in response to Mr. Floyd's cries for pain, is that belonging to the defendant? Yes, I had. Okay. And so you would acknowledge that Mr. Floyd was crying out in pain and the defendant was at least acknowledging that he could hear him at the time. If that's what the aha uh -huh was in response to. Okay. Well, was the aha uh -huh in the reasonable context in which this conversation, if you can call it that, took place in response and immediately after Mr. Floyd's individual cries for, for uh, pleas for pain or uh, claims of pain? It was the same time frame. Yeah. So my stomach hurts, uh-huh, my neck hurts, uh-huh, everything hurts, right? That's yes. what you heard. And the uh-huh was the defendant responding. Yes. All right, I'd like to take you then to Exhibit 49 starting, I'm sorry, at 2022-22, which is going to be overlapping the period we just saw. I'll just start it and I'd like you to pause it right away. 2022-22. All right, if you could hit play and I'll tell you when to pause. Stop. Okay. And so now at this point in time, you see uh, bystanders, correct? Yes. And you would acknowledge that they're not in the street, correct? Correct. They're on the sidewalk. Yes. Right. They're holding cell phones. Yes. Right. These are the two teenage girls I was talking about. Okay. This is the elderly gentleman I was talking about, Mr. McMillan. Okay. All right. Uh, they don't appear to be uh, doing anything threatening at that point, do they? No. They don't appear uh, to be making any noise at all at this point, do they? Uh, not that I could hear, no. And, and certainly would not have distracted the defendant. Uh, that I can't say. Well, they're not doing anything and they're not saying anything. So would a reasonable police officer in the defendant's position have been distracted by their non-action? I think he could have been aware of their presence and maybe start to plan for it. Okay, but you see in this, uh, at 2022-27, at least he's looking down at Mr. Floyd, he's talking to Mr. Floyd, at least acknowledging what Mr. Floyd is saying, right? Yes. And so while it's possible he could have potentially been aware of them, it doesn't appear he was from at least what we just saw here. True? Not from this snippet, no. Let's move ahead again then in Exhibit 43, starting at 2023-38. If you could publish that, please. Please. All right, now at that point you could hear somebody in the background, correct? Yes. You heard Mr. Floyd, true? Yes. His voice appeared slower than before? Possibly. Thicker than before? And what? Thicker? Yes. Okay. You also heard conversation, normal tone conversation between Officer Lane and the defendant, correct? Yes. Officer Lane said, roll him on his side. Right? Yes. And what was the defendant's response? Uh, something not yet. Okay. No, keep him here. Okay. Right? Okay. And so um, at this point, uh, Officer Lane is suggesting that they roll him on his side. Would that be consistent with the side recovery position? Yes. Okay. And uh, the defendant is rejecting the side recovery position at this point. True? Yes. He's hearing his information from his fellow officer, deciding a different course of action. Nothing the crowd's doing is preventing them from having that conversation. Is that right? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. And in, 
in your view of the clip that we just looked at, just focusing on the subject behavior, what is uh, Mr. Floyd doing? What was he doing in that clip? He's becoming more compliant. Well, is there any non-compliance you were able to see in that clip? In this clip, no. And so, uh, non, he's not exhibiting non-compliance and based on your testimony and your review and the plain video record in front of you, you see that the defendant has not changed his position, correct? Correct. He's still applying the same level of force that he did at the beginning of the restraint period, true? Uh, that I can't say. He's still kneeling on Mr. Floyd, correct? Yes. And, and you're not contending this was some sort of an accidental position, right? He didn't fall down onto Mr. Floyd and he, he was purposefully kneeling on him. Yes. True? Okay. All right. Uh, and so based on your view right, of the defendant being on top of Mr. Floyd, up to this point and beyond this point, the defendant did not alter the level of force that he was using on Mr. Floyd, did he? No. Even though Mr. Floyd by this point had become, as you put, compliant. Fair? More compliant, yes. Well, what part of this is not compliant? So I see his arm position in the picture that's posted. Right. That, you know, a compliant person would have both their hands in the small of their back and just be resting comfortably versus like he's still moving around. Did you say resting comfortably? or laying comfortably resting comfortably on the pavement yes at this point in time when he's attempting to breathe by shoving his shoulder into the pavement i was describing what the signs of a perfectly compliant person would be so attempting to breathe while restrained is a being slightly non-compliant no no You're aware, if, if we could take a look at uh, Tao's body worn camera starting uh, Exhibit 49 at 2023-38. And, and, and at this point, you see this Tao's body worn camera, we see more people here, correct? Yes. Right. You still see the teenage girl with the uh, cell phone? Right? Yes. Uh, she's joined by uh, what appears to be a juvenile female, correct? Yes. Wearing a love shirt. Yes. Right. Another teenager uh, filming. Is that right? And you, you see that? Yes. And then there's an individual in a, a hooded sweatshirt uh, standing on the sidewalk, correct? Yes. All right. If you could play that. We're done. You try. You try to just breathe it right there, bro. Okay. Okay. Uh, you don't think that what it is, bro? Uh, you don't think nobody understands that uh, shit right there, bro? I trained at the academy, bro. Okay. That's some bullshit, oh, okay. you did. Uh, okay. Right. Then That's you understand. That's bullshit, bro. All right. That's bullshit, bro. Breathe. You fucking stopping his breathing right there, bro. Yeah, yeah, breathe. Okay, he's talking. Okay, well, you heard Mr. Tao say he's talking, correct? Yes. He's referring to Mr. Floyd, right? Yes. I guess he was talking, wasn't he? Yes. And he said, I can't breathe, right? Yes. And it was even more slow at this point, correct? Could have been. And this is well within the restraint period, true? Yes. And uh, the individuals uh, here, in terms of the, the volume you're hearing, you, you don't hear this person saying anything, do you? No. Or her? No. Or her? No. Or him? No. Or him? I'm not sure of that. The uh, gentleman no. in the blue shirt with the baseball cap. No, didn't hear him say anything. Didn't hear the guy behind the person in the hooded sweatshirt say anything in the plaid shirt there? I didn't hear him, no. Okay, and so the only person that you would have heard say anything is the person in the hooded sweatshirt, correct? Yes. And, and what was he saying? Something about get off him, bro. You don't learn, you don't teach that in the academy. You don't learn in the academy. He said he was, you're cutting off his breathing, right? Okay. Fair to say he was expressing concern? Yes. In, in this uh, moment, uh, was this crowd a threatening crowd? No. All right, 
I'm going to take you to Exhibit 127 at 2024-18. Please publish that. Now, bro, he's not resisting arrest or nothing. You're talking now. You enjoy it. Look at you. Your body language is crazy. You're fucking it. bum. Bro, sit the fuck off it. It's the whites. They love what? women. Yeah, I already know that, bro. I train with half of these bum ass out. dudes at the academy, bro. You know that's bogus right now, bro. You know it's bogus. You can't even look at me like a man because you're a bum, bro. He's not even resisting arrest right now, bro. His nose is bleeding. Yeah, you fucking stopping his breathing right now, bro. You think that's cool? You think that? Okay. During that time period, and uh, I don't know if you heard, did you hear another officer? Did you hear the voice of Officer Lane say he's passing out? I didn't hear that. No. Did you hear Mr. Lane say that at any point in your analysis of these videos before you came to court today? About what Mr. Lane or Officer Lane said? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. And so you heard him say. Uh, at least one occasion, he's passing out, correct? Yes. And would you accept my representation that that would have occurred around this time during this clip? Yes. All right. And other people, uh, bystanders, are saying the same thing, correct? Uh, I heard mostly just what the one gentleman was saying about being a bum and not resisting arrest and things like that. Right. That the defendant was being a bum and that Mr. Floyd was not resisting arrest, correct? Yes. And you just saw the video. You saw Mr. Floyd, what he was doing at that time. At that time, would you agree, and I'll tell you the name of the person, is Donald Williams. Would you agree with Donald Williams that Mr. Floyd was not resisting arrest at that moment? Yes. Mr. Floyd doesn't appear to be conscious at the end of this clip, does he? I can't tell. And... Uh, you're certainly uh, not as close to him as the defendant was in that moment, correct? Correct. He's not talking, correct? Yes. He's not resisting. Doesn't appear to be, no. And from this point forward, the defendant remains on top of him, remains on top of him in the same position as when he started the restraint period. Isn't that true? I would say the same general position. I wouldn't say the same exact position. Yeah, same exact position, same general position. The position is such that he's on top of him, compressing his lungs, compressing his chest against the pavement, right, with his body weight. It's in a prone control position. In a restraint. He's restraining, correct? Yes. Can't move, right? Floyd can't move? Floyd can't move. No. He's not moving. He's not resisting. He's not talking. It's not possible, is it? To do what? Resist. I think it's definitely possible to resist. When you've passed out. He's not doing it here, is he? Not when he's passed out, no. When we talk about what's possible, let's talk about what's, what's happening in this case. He's not resisting, is he? And this snippet, no. Right. Uh, and from this point forward, right? From this point until the point at which the EMTs arrive, and tap on the defendant's shoulder and take Mr. Floyd and place him onto the gurney. From this point to that point, Mr. Floyd wasn't resisting, was he? No. The defendant maintained the same general position. Yes. Force must be reasonable at the start of the force, correct? Yes. Throughout the continuation of the force and at the end of the force, correct? Yes. And you reviewed these videos and you understand that the, by the time the defendant got off of Mr. Floyd, Mr. Floyd literally could not support his own head. Did you see that? Yes. You see the way he moved, the way his head moved when they moved him onto the gurney? I did. And a reasonable police officer in the position of the defendant, and that position is the position we see here on top of him, would know that, right? would know that he's not responsive, that he's not resisting. I think he would know he's not resisting. Because the officer said that he wasn't breathing. Said that to the defendant, right? The officer did or what the vice Mr. Lane. Did? Mr. Lane said that. Can you, can you, yeah, can you rephrase because I got lost. In I'm sorry. Mr. Lane said that. Mr. Lane said that to the defendant in the prior clip we watched, that he's not breathing. 
right? Well, I heard that he's passed out. I didn't hear the not breathing part. Well, the passed out came from the bystander, right? I'm not sure. Did you hear uh, at some point in your review, Officer King say that he couldn't find a pulse? Yes. All of this would have been known to a reasonable officer in the defendant's position, correct? Yes. And the defendant's position is and was and remains, as we see here at this moment, in this time, in this clip, on top of Mr. Floyd, on the street. Isn't that right? Yes. I have nothing further. Anything else? Mr. Broad, you were asked a lot of questions on, oops, if we could take this down here. We were asked a lot of questions uh, on cross-examination about the prone control position. Do you recall that? Yes. Can you describe what specifically you mean by the prone control position? What is the placement of the knee relevant relative to the back, neck, shoulders, etc.? Ideally 45 degrees in between the neck and shoulder blade. So 45 degrees coming in from the side? Yes, angling down towards the lower body. And where would the shin be placed? Just below the knee, same thing around the trapezoid area. So there's a kind of a hard spot in between the base of the neck and the shoulder blades. Is that the area Is you're talking about? Sustained. Can you, can you describe by touching your back the area that you're describing? So the knee would probably end up pretty much on the spine and the shin would be along the trapezoid. Okay, and during the course of this, uh, your testimony, you were shown several you know, short clip, clips of things happening from time to time, agreed? Yes. Um, what's the problem in terms of the analysis by looking at just specific short clips? Does it really show the sequence of events? It just shows little highlights of it? In terms of the analysis, the standard being the totality of the circumstances, agreed? Yes. And so when we kind of pick and choose, does it take into consideration everything that happens or that a reasonable officer would be doing at any particular time? No. And what would be another phrase for that? Mm, kind of picking and choosing. Like 2020 hindsight? Objection, reading, and argument. Sustaining that both. I'll withdraw. Now, in terms of the, uh, when someone is in the prone control position, you testified that you don't consider that to be a use of force, correct? Correct. And, and that's why again? It's a control hold. So the suspect is controlled, hopefully searched, and all you're doing is putting some minimal body weight to keep their body immobilized. Does it impact the structures of the neck? No. Can a suspect continue to lift up his head, move his head around? Yes. Do you observe Mr. Floyd doing that while he's in this position? Yes. Do you, did you observe him use his face to try to lift up his body? Yes. Did you observe um, throughout the course of this uh, event, did you observe Mr. Floyd's right arm in various body, body worn cameras? Yes. Did you observe ve his veins during that? Yes. What did the veins signify to you? Had strong pulse. He looks very muscular. Objection, foundation, Your Honor. Overall. In terms of when Mr. Chauvin first arrived on scene, what would have been the first thing Mr. Chauvin would have seen? The struggle that Mr. Floyd was giving to Officers Lane and King. And does that come into consideration of the analysis of the continued use of either force 
or a prone control? Yes. How about um, one versus three? How does that factor into the analysis? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Certainly. Um, you've observed the struggle between officers and Mr. Floyd. How many officers were there? Two, and then Officer Chauvin was the third. Okay. And how many suspects were they attempting to apprehend at, at that time? Just Mr. Floyd. Did Mr. Floyd, um, did all three officers at any point attempt to get Mr. Floyd into the back of their car? All three did. Were they successful in your analysis? No. So does the analysis in terms of, again, the continued use of force or putting someone in a prone restraint uh, include what happened moments before? Yes. And so if one person can overpower three, is that a factor to consider in whether to use a prone restraint or control technique? Yes, because it takes some of the strength that the suspect may have away from them. Are you familiar and with the what we would call the swarm technique? Yes. Well, can you describe for the jury what the swarm technique is? It's where multiple officers will use their body weight to pin a suspect down to the ground. And the purpose is? control and at the at the beginning of uh, the uh, prone position of mr. Floyd did you observe mr. Floyd continue at least initially to actively resist actively and with the kicking motion active aggression so let me ask you in terms of the, the concept of active aggression that's taking a, a swing or using some a force against an officer is that correct yes does active, re does active resistance have to be violent in order for it to be active resistance? No. Are there levels of active resistance? Sure. So um, can you explain how the level of active resistance may change? So pulling away from an officer would be one example of active resistance. Um, just muscle rigidity, refusing to let an officer pull your hands away from your body would be another example. Okay. So there are, there are, like all things, sort of a spectrum of active resistance, active aggression, or passive resistance, right? There's a spectrum of it, right? Yes. And during the course of the restraint of Mr. Floyd, do you continue to see Mr. Floyd actively resist to some degree yes he was struggling and how would you describe that within the spectrum of active resistance he's a very strong individual so a lot of that has to do with individual capability so he was still struggling the efforts of the three officers to control him a reasonable officer um, in, term, in terms of making a decision to put, keep someone in a prone restraint uh, can take into consideration the actions that immediately occurred immediately before. Rephrase, sustain. Would, is it possible for a reasonable police officer to, I'll, I'll rephrase, I'm sorry. Is the decision to use force or a restraint technique, a spectrum similarly? Yes. And officers are trained to assess the risk. Yes. It's preliminary, overruled. The, and the threat. Yes. Those were some questions you were asked about. They were. Why is it important to have a suspect in custody under control? For the safety of the officers and safety of the suspect. And if a suspect becomes more compliant and less actively resistant, does that eliminate the officer's uh, ability to maintain a restraint? No.
you were asked several questions about Mr. Floyd uh, stating that he couldn't breathe while he was being restrained. Did you hear those same statements during the struggle inside of the squad car? Yes. Did you hear them more than once at that time? Yes. Did you hear him uh, state that he was claustrophobic? Yes. Would a reasonable officer um, consider the actions of that person in relation to the words? Yes. If a person is saying he can't breathe and continues to actively resist, albeit at a lower level, would an officer, reasonable officer, take that into consideration? Yes. You were asked a series of questions about a, a singular point in time when Mr. Chauvin's knee, or excuse me, his toe came off the ground. Did you interpret that to be a, a, an increase in the amount of force applied to Mr. Floyd? I couldn't tell. You described in your cross-examination that he had to sort of catch himself on the squad car? Yes. Why do you, would you interpret that as a lack of balance or an effort to apply a greater amount of force? I think reaction to Mr. Floyd's body movement made the officer lose his balance momentarily. Do you think that um, if you're on two knees, just there's nothing underneath you, two knees on the ground, right? Um, is weight permanently equally distributed between those two knees? Objection to leading and be honest. Overruled on both grounds. No. Do people sort of move around? Yes. Do their weights shift? Yes. Do you observe that happening in this case? Repeatedly. Do you observe Mr. Chauvin or Officer Chauvin relieving some pressure at times when Mr. Floyd moves? Yes. Is that consistent with a prone control restraint? Yes. You were shown um, some videos when the first uh, young woman first came and started filming at approximately 20, 21, and 29 seconds. Do yes. you recall that? Did you factor into your analysis the timing of when EMS was called and then subsequently increased? to their, their response rate. I'm not sure if I understand the question. Sure. The videos that you watched, uh, some of the videos you watched when Ms. Frazier began filming at 2021-29, if EMS were called at 2021-35, code three, does that factor into the analysis? Yes. Why? Uh, knowledge of the area and the fact that they anticipate the response time going to be very rapid. Can you underestimate a member of a crowd or a group of people simply by virtue of their age? Certainly. Is it possible that a 17 year old person can place as uh, an officer in an equal amount of danger? As Absolutely. A, You've seen uh, other videos from other officers and you became aware, or did you become aware of the traffic patterns and the number of people driving by? Yes. In terms of the position of the officers relative to traffic. Uh, Objection beyond the scope, Your Honor. Overruled. How does that again factor into the analysis during this time frame? That would be an environmental hazard since they were almost in the traffic lane and there really wasn't any protective barriers around them. I 
show you I'm going to just show you one snippet um, at 202401 from Officer Lane's body camera. Uh, it was already in evidence, I believe, as Exhibit 49. <laughs> Ending at 2024-26, did you observe uh, Mr. Floyd's leg in that moment? Yes. Would a reasonable officer interpret that to be a form of active resistance? Possibly. Did you observe, how, how did you observe Officer Lane push that leg down? Was it gently or forcefully? Uh, forcefully, he took both his hands. We could take this down, Your Honor, for a moment. I'm going to um, show you what's been introduced as Exhibit um, 1020, which is the point at which uh, the ambulance and Mr. Chauvin stands up towards the end of this restraint. And I'm going to ask that this is already in evidence. I'm going to ask for you to make a determination as to where you think Officer Chauvin's uh, knee is. Looks to be on the left shoulder blade of Mr. Floyd. So it's fair to say that throughout, um, we'll just finish with this finish. Did that appear to be consistent with the prone restraint hold that you described? Yes. So if we can publish that to the jury then just... Would you agree that on the left hand side it appears that Mr. Chauvin's knee is on the neck of Mr. Floyd? No. How about on the right? No. So from that perspective, Mr. Broad, does it appear to be uh, consistent with a reasonable officer's use of the prone restraint technique? Yes. Is that sort of the problem with snippets? They don't show the full picture. Would you agree that the, well, you tell me. If a, 
if a group of people is compliant and passive at one moment, does that mean they're going to be at the next? No. Is a reasonable officer prepared, should a reasonable officer be prepared to uh, expect a change in a crowd? That'd be part of the situational awareness and planning process. If a, if one perceived threat or risk emerges while you're dealing with another, how is a reasonable officer trained to, to determine which risk or threat he should be dealing with? Uh, the officer's trained to address what they perceive to be the highest risk. If a reasonable officer has reason to believe that a, a person is passed out, can a reasonable officer be trained that if that person comes to, they may be more violent? They could. Have, has that happened to you in your law enforcement career? It has. And is that something a reasonable officer would take into consideration in assessing uh, whether it be a use of force or a use of prone restraint? They should take it into account. Would that cause the uh, a reasonable officer to be more or less concerned? Aware and more concerned. I have no further questions. Any recross? I do. So you're not still contending that the the prone restraint here was one that would not be likely to cause pain, are you? It could cause pain. Could cause pain, did cause pain, correct? I don't know if it caused pain, I'm saying it could cause pain. Did you look at the autopsy photos, were those submitted to you? No. Okay, so you didn't see the bruises on this man's shoulders, you didn't see that? No. You didn't see the bruises on his face? No. You couldn't use your context clues to determine that somebody trying to lift their, their body up with their face against the pavement, that that would cause pain? It would cause pain, wouldn't it? Lifting the face up off the pavement? That's right. Not necessarily. No, using your face to lift your body up off the pavement. Objection. That would cause pain. Objection. Overruled on that ground. That could cause pain. The only struggling that you saw Mr. Floyd doing after he was restrained was struggling to breathe. Isn't that right? Well, that Overruled on that ground. I don't know. If he was struggling or was he struggling to catch a breath, I can't tell. In any event, uh, struggling to breathe is not active resistance, is it? To me, no. To the officer, it may be. But officers are trained in, in terms of the dangers of positional asphyxia. Officers are trained that there can be a, a physical response to having uh, oxygen deprived of you as a result of the pressure. Isn't that right? There can be. Overruled. You can answer. They're trained about that. Yes. Right? And it's, it's much like the analogy that's used if somebody's holding your head underwater, there's a natural reaction to, to, to struggle, correct? Yes. And and that's the danger, right, of the of the cycle of positional asphyxia is that the officer might not recognize that what they're doing is causing the person to react. True? It's quite possible. And you don't contend that it was reasonable for the defendant to hold Mr. Floyd down on the pavement in this position to avoid him getting hit by a car, are you? No. No. I said no. All right. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Nothing further. Anything further? No, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Thank you.
Members of the jury, our next witnesses are not available till tomorrow, and so we're going to recess for the day. Uh, the lawyers and I have some issues to deal with right now and also at 8.45 tomorrow, but we still hope to start about 9.15 or 9.30 tomorrow. Hopefully we'll be done with our issues by then, so have a good night. Don't talk to anyone. Don't watch the news. Thank you. Council, uh, we have some time here at the end of the day. We have some cleanup matters as far as exhibits and some that were provisionally offered and some that were, I think everybody assumed were offered. Uh, Mr. Frank, uh, anything you'd like to do to clean that up or? Sure, you're close enough to that microphone and it is on, so. Uh, your Honor, we have a number of questions regarding exhibits, and I think we can deal with them uh, on the record at this time. Um, Your Honor, we uh, understand that Exhibit 15, the record rate may reflect it had been conditionally offered through Donald Williams um, because Ms. Frazier was going to testify later. Um, if it was not made clear that that was then being formally offered, uh, sufficient foundation was certainly laid for that during Ms. Frazier's testimony, so we would ask that Exhibit 15 be formally offered at this time and received. Any objection to that, Mr. Nelson? Aye, Your Honor. Is uh, formally received. And Your Honor, we had Exhibits 922 through 951, slides that were used during Dr. Tobin's testimony, and we just want to be clear that the record reflects we are agreeing that those should be considered only as demonstrative exhibits and should not then go back to the jury as substantive exhibits. Agreed, Mr. Nelson? Agreed. Uh, it did appear that they were demonstrative at the time, even though it was not specifically stated, so we'll change the status of those two demonstrative only. It will not go back to the jury. And Your Honor, during Dr. Smock's testimony, there was reference to uh, a demonstrative about the signs of excited delirium. Uh, that may have been referenced as 921, uh, or I'm sorry, may have been referenced as 941 when it was actually 921. Um, 941 obviously falls within the exhibits we just talked about uh, as demonstrative. So that we believe should be marked as 921. We understand that that's a demonstrative anyway and would not go back to the jury. Thank you. Correct. I'm not doubting Mr. Frank. So one more time, Mr. Frank, uh, 941 should actually be 921? I think it may have just been referenced during, the, during court as 941. We have it marked as 921, and it's a demonstrative anyway. All right. So Mr. Schaefer, uh, how do you have it? Hey, that's the um, 10 signs of excited delirium. Correct. Yeah, I, I had it in the record as 941. All right, leave it as 941? Demonstrative only, or did you want? Nine, so then there would be two 941s, so it should be 921. So the slide deck on excited delirium, which was marked and received as 941 for demonstrative purposes only, should be remarked as 921 for demonstrative purposes only. Correct. I believe that's correct, Your Honor. All right, so ordered. Then, Your Honor, um, during the testimony of uh, Chief Arredondo, there was reference made to Exhibit 269, which was the map of the Minneapolis precincts. Our record showed that that was offered and received, um, but maybe some question about that. So at this time, we are formally offering uh, 269. Any objection to that? That's the colored precinct map, is that correct? No objection. 
269 is formally received. Can we return back to 9? I forgot what we finally marked it as. The Excited Delirium slide deck. 921. 921. Um, I think the record should reflect we had a Chambers conference about uh, redaction of that before it was uh, given to the jury. No, that's that's a different one, Your Honor. Right. Okay. I'll wait for you guys, and I'll speak when you speak to it. Because we did have a Chambers discussion on a redaction. Uh, that would be 1,053-ish, uh, but we'll, we'll come back to that. If we can. Sure. Okay. Your Honor, uh, Exhibit 110, uh, which is one of the M Minneapolis Police Department uh, Defense uh, Policies uh, Training Guide. We uh, indicated it was offered and received during Lieutenant Mercil's testimony, but there may be some question about that. Uh, so just to clarify for the record, we are formally offering 110. And that was, again, the, your description? It's the uh, Defense and Control Response Training Guide. No objection. All right. 110 is formally received. Um, your Honor, Exhibit 255, we indicate that it was offered and received during uh, Sergeant Steiger's testimony, but again, there may be a question about whether that was actually done, and so we would just formally offer 255 at this time. Mr. Nelson? 155. 255. And what's the description of that again, Mr. Frank? Um, it is a screenshot from King's body worn camera at 8 19 That's one I don't have a copy of. Two five five. I don't have a copy of that one, Council. Two five five. And it was at what time? Eight nineteen thirty five. So twenty nineteen thirty five. Correct. Um, you have that it was offered and received, but the court doesn't have. Right? Correct. No objection. All right, 255 is received if it was not before. And Your Honor, um, Exhibit 122, uh, which our records identify as the MPD Crisis Intervention Training PowerPoint, um, we believe was uh, referenced, uh, may not have been formally offered, but we would offer it this time. Can I have a moment to chat? Sure. And the number again, Mr. Frank? Your Honor, upon further review, uh, we would withdraw Exhibit 122. All right, 122 is withdrawn. Your Honor, then um, just for clarification of the record, if it's necessary, Exhibits 624 and 628 uh, were just only used to refresh recollection, not offered as exhibits. Understood. Marked but not offered or received. I believe that clears up the rest of the questions. Those were just offered to refresh recollection, you said, and they were never offered formally. Correct. Mr. Schaefer, anything else that, uh, any other loose ends? Oh, I think we have it. But can I get the inclusive number of the demonstrative from Dr. Tobin? Did you say it was 922 through 951? 922 through 951. Okay. Uh, what? Let's. Are we ready to talk about the milestone camera and the player? Yeah. 
Yeah, that was the next thing on our list. Mr. Nelson? So, Your Honor, our request was that um, the milestone video that was introduced, um, I believe, as exhibit. that the state introduced as exhibit number 11, which was the milestone video uh, in its entirety, but it was cropped and, and excerpted, meaning it was not the entire three hours or whatever. Um, it is the defense position that we don't have an objection to that being excerpted as far as the length of the time. However, it's our position that the actual evidence in the case would include the player for the milestone as opposed to a recorded version of it. Um, the reason is, Your Honor, uh, when, when that exhibit was demonstrated or played, published in court, it appeared to be very choppy. It appeared to be at a reduced period of time. Um, I don't know if that was simply a computer problem or some technology problem. When I look at it on my computer, I see the same choppy thing, uh, choppiness to it. The milestone player, as was testified to by Lieutenant Rubel, specifically allows the camera to zoom in, zoom out, um, you know, be manipulated. Um, you can see that in the video, the user of the video is actually doing that at time because the cameras can be moved. That's the actual exhibit, and it allows um, the jury to interpret that video accordingly. The, the submission that was uh, conditionally accepted um, is not the actual exhibit, it's not the best evidence. Mr. Frank. Thank you, Mary. I'm not quite sure what the best evidence rule has to do with it, but that, let me just say it this way. That I think he was using it as a phrase and not the rule. Yeah, probably, I guess. Say again? Nothing. Not sure anybody really knows what the best evidence rule means anymore, so uh, I'll move on. Um, Your Honor, we, we offered exhibit 11 um, for a specific purpose, and that was for the 911 operator, Jenna Scurry. Um, it was cropped because the speedway sign occupies a big corner of, uh, of that video. And um, so that's why it was offered as Exhibit 11. We offered and, and the court received Exhibit 42 uh, through Lieutenant Rugel. That was the milestone video uh, of about 49 minutes long. That is the full video. It has the speedway sign. It's from the time that Mr. Floyd is at the store to the fire truck leaves. Um, that's the full video uh, that we intend to offer. Um, it plays the, we still believe that the slight catching of the video was just simply a computer issue at that time and getting it to you know, load and play. Before we send the exhibits back to the jury, we'll of course make sure that it plays at its normal speed. But that's the actual video, um, and that's all we intend to offer. It, it plays, and that's all we intend to offer. Is 11 a sub part of 42? Correct. And I apologize, Your Honor, I was referring to the wrong, uh, wrong exhibits. But yes, 11 is a, is a condensed, excerpted, and cropped version of 42. So we're just talking about whether the player should go back for 42. With the same length of time, and that would be our position, yes. How did Lieutenant Rugel play it when he was testifying? Your Honor, we had a, an offer of proof with Lieutenant Rugel where when, I, when it was originally played, the jury went out um, and I... Hmm showed how it would actually worked with uh, the player. So, what's the state's position about sending the player back? Your Honor, I think the jury should receive the video itself and, and not be given the player so that they can uh, zoom in and zoom out. They should have the evidence that is the video and, and not the player. That's our position. Mr. Nelson? It's not the milestone video without the player. And, or, and so, again, it's within the province of the jury. They may not use that feature. I mean, it's, it is the evidence. It's the it, it is the video. <laughs> we laid a foundation for it through an expert uh, who works in the field. It's the video itself. 
right. if you've tested it out on the computer that's going back to the jury and it plays smoothly, I'm going to deny the request to send the player with uh, because the tools of the Milestone video player were not used as part of testimony and the evidence itself is the video. And so to allow the, the Zoom and other features were not really offered as part. And so, uh, But if it's choppy, the player is going back, pure and simple, because they have to have a way to play what is, as the state says, the evidence, and that is the video. Can't be choppy, can't be a different speed. It's got to be real time going ahead with the uh, uh, player or not. So, so let's make sure that happens, and uh, if the state can make sure you represent back to the court that it is in working order. And I'll assume it is, but please verify that you've done the testing. Thank, Thank you. you. Anything else that we have to clean up? Mr. Slisher? If I may, uh, counsel indicated in the bench conference today that he has a, a motion that he wants to make. He wants to address that. Oh, yes. Um, we went immediately from the state resting into the defense case. I had assured Mr. Nelson off the record to maximize the jury's time that he could reserve his motion until we had a break when the jury was not present. Accordingly, uh, any motions he makes as far as the judgment of acquittal are timely and they're just being memorialized at this time. Mr. Nelson? If we could uh, take that up tomorrow morning, perhaps come a little bit before the other hearing. Well, let's do 845. We'll, we'll, we should be able to do most of this. All right, we'll take that up tomorrow. Uh, any other motions? Uh, I did want to memorialize, uh, I think you said it was 1053 was the exhibit of the Excited Delirium slide deck. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, I believe it's, let me just double check here. In any case, we had a, a Chambers conference uh, at the state's request to talk about redactions. And I did order redacted one picture out of that because uh, it was not relevant. And given the very limited purpose for which it was offered, uh, deleted the picture that showed someone being restrained in the prone position with a knee on the neck. It was not part of the Excited Delirium presentation. It was just coincidental with some of the facts we might have here. Uh, so that photo was redacted. And also there was a list of references at the last slide that was deleted because we don't want to have the jury look at that and then decide to do some internet research. Not that they would have the tools uh, back there, but uh, in deliberation, but nevertheless. Uh, so those are the redactions that I was aware of. Is that correct? And I uh, completed those redactions over the lunch hour. I provided a copy to the state. All right, and that will receive that redacted version as Exhibit 1053. I think that was all the bench sidebars that we were not so that were substantive. Everything else seemed to be non-substantive scheduling. Anything else that we have to make a record of before tomorrow? Your Honor, there we have been um, just taking notes of bench conferences throughout the course of the trial. Sure. And in terms of some of the bench conferences, um, at least from our position, and I'm not expecting the state to respond to these immediately, um, but in terms, I just want to memorialize some of the conferences that we've had either in chambers or at sidebar. Um, your Honor, um, it is based upon our recollection that on March 30th of 2021, um, the in a morning chambers meeting, uh, in terms of the adolescent witnesses who testified that day, the court directed the state to lead the wit the younger witnesses, uh, gave them permission to lead the witnesses. Um, that was all within the context of the. Um, discussion about whether they would be videoed and audioed and things of that nature. Um, with respect to Mr. Williams's testimony, there was a sidebar um, where the defense objected, uh, I think you sustained the objection uh, as to Mr. Williams being a security expert. Just wanted to note that that was the substance of that sidebar. Um, at sidebar, a second sidebar, um, there was a defense objection as a rep, rep repetitious um, questions about Mr. Williams feeling that F Mr. Floyd was in danger. Um, the defense objected to that. If, I think that's reasonable. We'll get that sent out tonight. All right. 
just one last thing, Your Honor. Um, in terms of just as the court is aware, there's been ongoing disclosures um, that have been going on throughout the course of this case. Um, and I think we could probably have a chambers conference regarding a couple of things if the court would be so inclined. Um, but as based on my records, at the point that this trial start, started, we had received 29 disclosures totaling 45,118 bait stamps items. As of um, yesterday's date, we were up to 41 disclosures totaling 50,272 disclosures. There have been some discussions, uh, and I know that there have been more disclosures that have come in since. Um, some of these disclosures uh, involve uh, potential impeachment materials of expert witnesses and things of that nature, um, and they are quite voluminous. And so if we could have a discussion about what, if any, of these materials the state in would intend to impeach with, um, that would potentially be helpful. Um, <coughs> I think we're, yeah, we're actually up to, yeah, as of yesterday, we were at 50,272. So it would be very helpful to help uh, have a meaningful opportunity for me to have a meaningful opportunity to review those between now and, and tomorrow when I expect a couple of experts to testify. Are these related to your experts? I believe a, a significant portion of it is. All right. Since the disclosure is fairly late, um, I, I, I'm not saying untimely. <laughs> I'm saying, but it is late in the game. I would ask that the state meet with uh, Mr. Nelson and kind of indicate what it is you're planning on impeaching with. Your Honor, you know, we continue to be of the position that those are matters we have actually no duty to disclose other than the court's order in this case that we do them. Of course, that order was made at a time uh, recently and we have been disclosing um, those things you know that we had and that as we continue to get of course as we prepare for these witnesses um, they may never be used but their potential you know for impeachment and the court ordered us to disclose them so we're doing that um, now to further ask us to uh, tell counsel what we're going to use to impeach it's a little difficult to do before you hear the testimony well, i could continue the trial so give them enough time to prepare i don't see a need to do that your honor i think the I think it, this is my point. I'm not saying the state is acting in bad faith, not at all. These things are moving targets. But when we are actually in trial on the eve of Mr. Nelson calling these witnesses, I th and I would not restrict you to what you could impeach with. I'm just saying what you know you will use to impeach these witnesses if you could at least highlight those, reserving the right to put other things in. I'm sure there's stuff that right now you know what you're going to use to impeach. Other things, maybe, maybe not. The maybe, maybe nots, I'm fine with you just waiting. But if you know there are things you're going to impeach with, I think it is appropriate given the fact that these are being disclosed late in the game. Again, not making any accusation of impropriety, just they are late in the game. I don't want to have to <laughs> give Mr. Nelson a continuance and have the jury sit around to give him an appropriate amount of time to prepare. What I'm saying is it gets us to putting these witnesses in front of the jury quicker if we just work together on uh, highlighting things. So I am ordering the state to at least what they know for sure they're going to impeach with. Understood, Your Honor. We'll do what we can. All right. I appreciate that. Okay. Anything else for the record? Uh, I do need to talk to you in chambers about an issue that um, relates to security. With Security, everybody. I need counsel. Just counsel. All right, thank you. We are adjourned for the day then. Uh, let's get back at 845 tomorrow for the other issues.